Hey podcast listeners, this is Robert Wiblin, Director of Research at 80,000 Hours. Today's episode sets a new length record for the show, but it's also extremely comprehensive. I had time in our session to ask Lewis uh, all of the questions I had about how to effectively help animals, and fortunately he had a lot to say in return. If you want to spend a few hours learning everything you need to know about ending animal cruelty to animals in agriculture in an effective way, I don't really know of any single better resource than this now. I've added a link to a comprehensive overview of the conversation so you can skip to whatever sections or questions you're particularly interested in listening to. As always, we also have a full transcript and links to the job opportunities and research pieces that we discuss. Uh, The link is in the show notes. You can get the episode on your phone, so you can listen to it whenever you like and at whatever speed you like, uh, perhaps over a couple of sessions, by searching for 80,000 hours in your podcasting app. If what we've talked about today uh, piques your interest in working on farm animal welfare or any of the other causes that we discuss on the show, you should definitely apply for free one-on-one career coaching from 80,000 hours. We've now helped hundreds of people formulate their plans and compare between their options, and in some cases introduced them to mentors, collaborators, funders, or even gotten them into high-impact jobs. It takes a few minutes to apply for a 45-minute Skype call with us, but the application process itself is designed to give you or to help you structure your own thinking and give you a list of actionable next steps. The link to apply is in the podcast description or the blog post where you found this episode. Our guide to improving institutional decision-making, which I talked about in the podcast with uh, Julia Gayleff last time, is now out, and so I'll link to that from this episode as well. And now I bring you Lewis Bollard. Today, I'm speaking with Lewis Bollard. Lewis leads the Open Philanthropy Project strategy for farm animal welfare. Full disclosure, the Open Philanthropy Project is one of 80,000 hours' biggest donors. Prior to joining the Open Philanthropy Project... He worked as policy advisor and international liaison to the CEO at the Humane Society of the U.S., also called HSUS. And prior to that, he was a litigation fellow at HSUS, a law student, and an associate consultant at Bain & Company. He has a BA from Harvard University in social studies and a JD from Yale Law School. Thanks for coming on the podcast, Lewis. Great to be here. We plan to talk about Lewis's work making grants, uh, how we can most effectively help animals, and how listeners can best use their careers to improve animal welfare. But first off, Lewis, what originally drew you to dedicate your career to helping animals, and why did Open Phil end up focusing on it, uh, among other things? Sure. So when I was a teenager, I became aware of global poverty first, and like I imagine many of your listeners, it was uh, an issue that really struck me as incredibly important and incredibly neglected. Uh, And then I later became aware of factory farming. And it struck me as also important, but even more neglected and and with really clearer solutions. And so really since I've been a teenager, this is an issue that I've been very passionate about, wanted to work on. As far as Open Philanthropy Project went, they have these three criteria, importance, tractability, and neglectedness for selecting cause areas. And farm animal welfare lined up on all three of those criteria. And so I think the the primary consideration was ultimately just this is a major issue. It's being neglected by the donors and there's the real potential to gain some traction here. Do you want to give us some numbers to help give an an idea of the scale and tractability and and neglectedness of the problem? Sure. So starting with numbers for the scale of the problem, if you look at the number of animals being farmed at any point in time, globally, there are about 23 billion chickens at any point in time alive in farms, overwhelmingly in intensive factory farming systems globally. Now, about 15 billion of them are broiler meat chickens and the other 8 billion roughly are layer hens. There are another roughly 6 billion land uh, land mammals that are being farmed. So that's pigs, uh, cows, rabbits. Um, and then there's somewhere between 35 billion and 140 billion farmed fish at any point in time. And those numbers are incredibly imprecise because no one is keeping track of precise numbers. So the Food and Agriculture Organization keeps pretty good track of the numbers of land animals, but not the numbers of farm animals. And if you're also concerned about wild-caught fish, the numbers could be in the trillions. Mm. So certainly there on the, the, the importance of the issue. If you look on the neglectedness side, 
the numbers are also pretty stark. Before we came into this space, I'd say that there was probably about $20 million a year being devoted to this problem in its entirety. Uh, that's now probably increased to maybe $50 million a year. Sorry, $20 million in the US or globally? Globally. Wow, that's really very little. So, so there were almost no farm animal advocacy organizations or only a handful? There were only a handful of farm animal organizations. And when I say that number, I'm only counting certain things. I'm not counting, for instance, farm sanctuaries, uh, where it's providing direct care for farm animals. But if you really just look at advocacy for farm animals, it was extremely limited. A couple of groups like Mercy for Animals, Compassion on World Farming had been around for several years, but had very small budgets. Hmm. Do you have any concrete way of assessing the severity of animal suffering, any kind of quantitative measure that you can use? I mean, ideally, I guess, to compare it to human suffering, but uh, short of that, just, you know, how bad is it in a general sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it would would certainly be great to have a more rigorous quantitative measure to compare with human suffering. I think for now that all we can really do is compare within species because our ability to understand the relative experiences of different species is still so limited. Mm -hmm. But within species, you can look at a couple of of different things. You can first look at, uh, with acute pain experiences, how long do they last? So we know, for instance, with castration in piglets, and this is standard practice for virtually all male piglets globally, we know that that is a process that causes minutes of intense pain as measured by stress responses and that they're still feeling some degree of pain days, weeks later. Uh, When it comes to chronic suffering, you can look at the conditions and you can use aversion studies. So you can say, we've put these hens into a cage or we can put these hens into a cage-free environment and we can see how much effort they will exert to get out of that cage environment and how much effort they'll exert to get things that they're not receiving currently, like access to a nesting, nesting box, as to access to a perch. Hmm. So some people advocate for vegetarianism or try to scale back animal agriculture on the basis of uh, environmental and health benefits mm-hmm. as well as animal welfare benefits. Do you think those, those gains are large compared to those that we might hope to get from animal welfare improvements? I, I think the environmental gains are real. I, I think that uh, if you look at the, the, the best global estimates right now, the Food and Agriculture Organization estimates that about 14.5% of global greenhouse gas emissions come from animal agriculture. If you look at land use or water use, the percentages are significantly higher in terms of the amount of water used globally and and the amount of land. So from an environmental perspective, I think there's a very clear case, particularly um, for moving toward pulses, whole grains, other relatively low uh, carbon footprint foods. Mm. What grants have you made at OpenFill, and how long has the program been running? So we started this program in October of 2015, and since then, we've made about $30 million of grants within farm animal welfare. Those grants were initially directed largely toward corporate campaigns to eliminate some of the worst practices within animal agriculture. So we began with grants to support corporate campaigns to phase out battery cages in the United States and then extended those campaigns globally to work in Latin America and in Europe. We've also sought to reach neglected regions and neglected issues. So we've made a set of grants in China, a set of grants in India, a set of grants related to fish welfare. And then we also remain open to exceptional opportunities that fall outside of these core buckets. So one example would be the Good Food Institute, Uh, which is working on alternatives to animal proteins. Another example would be animal charity evaluators, which is looking to build the field and evaluate animal charities. Hmm. How did you go about deciding which groups to fund and and which ones not to fund? So the, the number one thing we look for is whether the group is operating in an area of high impact. So a group working on fish has the potential to do so much more than a group that's working, for instance, solely on cows, just because there are so many more fish out there. A group working in China has the potential to do a great more impact than a group working in New Zealand. uh, But the second thing we look for is a track record. So to what degree has this group chalked up tangible victories in the past? And this was something that was very appealing about the corporate K-Tree campaigns, was we could track very tangible outcomes from these campaigns in the past. And then the third thing is a good team or good leadership. So we look for people who seem to be highly competent, seem to have a clear sense of success, seem to be flexible and willing to adjust their tactics and strategies based on on past experience. 
So most animal advocates seem focused on uh, animals that are easier to sympathize with, perhaps like pigs and cows. But mm. you're kind of going in the opposite direction, thinking of chickens and fish and I guess potentially even insects or, or other more unusual cases like mm-hmm. that. Yeah, so the case for focusing on chickens and fish is very similar to the case for focusing on farm animal welfare as a cause. In terms of importance, there are more than than 10 times as many chickens as there are, for instance, pigs, and there are more than 100 times potentially as many farmed fish as there are for pigs. So the numbers are really there. Then in terms of neglectedness, it's also the case. So certainly we need more funding for work on pigs and cows and and other more charismatic mammals, but there's been a real dearth of funding around fish, chickens, and other animals that people don't think about or relate to as easily. Hmm. But while there's 10 times or so as as many chickens, um, their brains are also about a one-hundredth the size of of the brain of a a pig, right? Uh, And and a similar number to the the brain of of a cow. Um, so it's, I guess it's not completely obvious that there's more suffering in chickens than, than pigs in the world, right? Certainly not completely obvious. I mean, I think there's a really interesting question about how to compare the well-being of different species. I do think it's very unlikely that the sheer size or weight of a brain is likely to be closely correlated with ability to suffer. I think if, if that were true, we should possibly be focused on sperm whales or on elephants or other uh, large creatures with huge, huge brains. Uh, but I think what we see even within humans is that brain size can differ and it doesn't necessarily affect a uh, relative capacity to suffer. Okay, well, maybe let's come back to that in a, in a minute. Um, another interesting study is that about half of the world's fish and a quarter of the world's land uh, farmed animals are in China. Mm-hmm. Um, so why is open fill not, not focused on, on China and perhaps India as well? Yeah, so we are as much as we can be. We see China and India as, as absolutely top priorities, particularly China. Uh, as you note, a huge portion of the world's farm animals are, are based there. And contrary to some perceptions, it's not for export. It's primarily for domestic consumption that these animals are being raised in China. Uh, So we have made a set of about $4 million worth of grants to groups in China. And the primary constraint on making more grants than that is a lack of opportunities in China. So we've already supported most of the groups that were excited about doing work there and that have a legal ability to work there. And that's another constraint in terms of operating in China. Mm. Is it is there just a lack of uh, any, any people who take an interest in animal welfare in China? Is it is it just a, kind of not a cultural issue there? I'm not sure what the what the origins are. I think that it it is true that there is less civil society across many sectors in China. I think it's something we naturally see that in more developed countries there are more people focused on social activism than there are in still developing or emerging economies. And my hope is that as China develops further, we'll see more of this. And I think we already are. I mean, one of the most heartening things to me in China is seeing the recent protests around the dog meat trade within China, which, to be clear, the dog meat trade is is really no worse than the trade in pigs or chickens uh, in China or elsewhere. But the fact that this is an issue that's really mobilized a lot of Chinese, gotten a lot of people out involved protesting, stopping trucks, suggests to me something very heartening about the future of animal advocacy in China. That at least there's many people who, in principle, think that animals can matter in particular cases. Yeah. Exactly. And the fact that they're willing to devote their time and, and really to undergo some serious risks mm. to, uh, to be engaged in this kind of activism. Mm. Why have you focused so much on corporate uh, reform campaigns? It sounds like that's the main thrust of your work at the moment. Yeah, it's certainly not the, the only thrust, but I would say uh, about a third of our portfolio probably has, has gone to support directly corporate campaigns. And the reason really is that the track record recently has been very impressive. So when we started supporting corporate campaigns in late 2015, Groups in the U.S. had already secured some some critical victories on Cage Free. They'd gotten Costco, one of the largest retailers, to go Cage Free. They'd gotten Aramark and Compass Group, the largest food service companies, and they'd just gotten McDonald's within the the fast food sector. And in the year and a half since then, they've basically gotten the remainder of the entire U.S. food industry to make commitments to move away from battery cages. And there are certainly questions about how much better is that transition from battery cages to Cage Free. But I feel very confident that that transition only happened because of the advocacy of these campaigning groups. 
Do you have a sense of uh, how many animals you're helping, kind of per thousand dollars that you that you spend in these in these grants to corporate welfare campaigns? Or? Yeah. So our rough cost effectiveness estimate is that these uh, cage free campaigns are at least 150 animals per dollar spent. And what we mean by that is 150 hens moved from a cage to a cage free environment for a year per dollar spent. And one of the assumptions there is that these campaigns only brought forward progress by five years. I think that's a pretty uh, conservative assumption. I think it's quite likely they brought forward progress by much more than five years. So we're only counting five years of of benefits. Um, But yeah, 150, and I I would say there's a wide potential spectrum, maybe 100 to 250 per per dollar there. Hmm. What is your research work at Open Phil like uh, day to day? How, How do you spend your time? So I spend my time between a combination of online research, trying to read the latest reports, both from animal advocacy groups, from animal charity evaluators, but also from the industry. So reading industry publications to see what changes are happening, what's influencing them. Uh, And I spend a lot of time on the phone with animal advocates. So I spend a lot of time finding out what are the things people are thinking about, what are they doing. And I try and spend a decent amount of time on the phone with independent experts. So talking, for instance, to fish welfare scientists or talking to people who are experts on the non-profit situation in China. Um, And then combining those two things, I think that the third um, task is kind of compiling that. And this is something I have a monthly newsletter where I I seek to kind of synthesize some of those findings together and really see what is there that we can learn from these disparate sources that can be useful for our philanthropy. Mm. Do you do a lot of follow-up with the groups that you make grants to, to, to see how they're going? We do, yeah, and we're looking to increase that follow-up too over time. So our, our current um, setup is that we look to talk to each of our grantees at least once every six months to understand what wins they've had, what losses they've had, what they've learned, what they've changed about their plans. In the case of larger grantees, I'm talking to them more often than that, perhaps every few weeks. We want to be very careful not to be in the role of micromanaging them or to be dictating their tactics or telling them what to do. But we absolutely do want to understand how they're doing and what they're up to, both in terms of renewing the grants, but also so we can share those lessons with other philanthropists. I guess a lot of the grants are pretty recent, but do you have a sense of how well those uh, um, the, the, the money is being spent? Are you getting the bang for buck that you were hoping for? Yeah, I'm very excited about how the grants have gone so far. So... As I mentioned, one of the biggest categories is, is the corporate campaign grants, and, and those have significantly exceeded our expectations. We, we did not expect that the U.S. corporate campaigns would have already produced K-Tree pledges across basically the entire food industry, and they've similarly exceeded expectations internationally. So large U.K., German, French retailers making similar commitments based on, on these campaigns. The other things we funded, I think it's generally too soon to tell. So for instance, with our China grants, with our India grants, a lot of what we're looking to do is to build up a movement and to build up capacity over the longer term. And I think, unfortunately, we'll only really be able to evaluate the effectiveness of those grants over a five, 10 or or longer year time frame. Hmm. So coming back to uh, your your day-to-day work, uh, is OpenFill a place that you would recommend that that people work? Is it it a fun place to work or at least an exciting place to work? Yes, I'd, I'd definitely recommend it. Um, and, and not just because my boss is probably listening to this podcast. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure he knows it all already. He's probably just skipped for it. <laughs> yeah. I, um, I mean, I, I think it really is kind of a, a, a dream job in the sense of if you care most about having an impact within one of the cause areas that Open Phil works on, and, and in my case, my what I care most about is having an impact on, on farm animal welfare, then there are not only the resources there, the financial resources to do that, but also a huge amount of autonomy to really pursue what appear to be the most promising opportunities and to spend a lot of time researching them and to really make grant recommendations based on on your best judgment. What are the biggest frustrations of the work? I think one of the real frustrations is a lack of good data. So, you know, I've mentioned some of the data we do have on, on total animal numbers, for instance, from the Food and Agriculture Organization, but we don't have good data on the experiences of these animals. So we don't have great data even on what percentage of animals in different countries or in different types of production systems or undergoing different kinds of physical mutilations or particular kinds of slaughter. Mm. We also don't have robust data 
on what those experiences are like. And so robust data of the sort you were asking for earlier of, of how would we compare the experiences of different animals, we're still really going off very limited evidence. And, and it would be great to see more data on that. And so that can be very frustrating when we're trying to compare grants. And that could be the most important thing to distinguish based on. We just, we don't have it. Thinking about working at OpenFill specifically, are there any downsides of the work there that, that people might not consider? I mean, it, it sounds extremely appealing. You have <laughs> uh, potentially hundreds of millions of dollars in the mm -hmm. long term to, mm -hmm. to give away. Uh, are there any things that make that, that difficult or unpleasant? Well, I, I, think, I think the flip side of great autonomy is that you're not, um, you, you don't have as much of the benefits of being part of a team. I mean, there certainly is a team at Open Philanthropy, but we're each working on very distinct issues. And... So within my work on animal welfare, it can it can be a little lonely at time. I mean, there aren't a lot of other. There's no one else there working solely on this issue, and so there are people I'll talk to about it. There's people who will give me guidance, but it's it's not something if you if you're looking for a real team environment, the program officer role at least doesn't really fit that bill. Why haven't you hired a research assistant or something like that? <laughs> uh, so we're actually looking into the possibility now, and uh, for interested listeners, my hope is is we will be looking to recruit that in the, in the next few months, and you can look out for that opportunity. Um, so so yeah, it's on it's on the horizon. <laughs> what kind of personal traits will you be looking for uh, above above others? So I think the most important trait for me is someone who is analytical and good at dealing with data and independent research. Obviously, we want people who care about the issue, both care about farm animal welfare and ideally uh, care about effective altruism and, and having the greatest impact. Um, but, but generally, I'm trying to keep a pretty open mind otherwise about what that person would look like in terms of their worldview, their ideology, their background. I think the most important thing is, is just that analytical ability and the intelligence to really be able to engage in debates and to be able to, to criticize me and to kind of you know, prove me wrong on things. Because I think one of the dangers of only having one person and one of the real benefits of having another person is that you can get a little more diversification of, of views on things. We'll put up a link to, to that job vacancy uh, when, when it goes up. Are there any other um, jobs that uh, or job vacancies that OpenFill has at the moment? I think we've had we have some vacancies in the logistics team. I think we've been looking for um, possibly a couple of people in the logistics team, and I'm pretty sure those are those are up on the website. Okay, well we'll link we'll link to those uh, as well. Are there any organisations you've investigated that you ultimately decided uh, not to fund? And I guess without you know naming any names, uh, what were the uh, reasons for that? Sure. Yeah, we've had a number of investigations that we opened and and ultimately decided not to fund, and there have been a variety of reasons for that. I'd say the most common reason is that we weren't excited about the particular proposals presented to us for what this group would do with additional funding. So even where a group seemingly has a good track record or has a good leadership team, we still want to see really tangible plans for how they need and would use more funding. So I'd say that's that's the most common one. Otherwise, we, we've also just found other red flags. We've, we've heard during the evaluation process of a group negative things or, or disputes about their track record. Um, or, or we've come to see perhaps that particular strategy when we look at the, the cost effectiveness estimate, the numbers really aren't as good as we expected them to be. If you have an existing group that's doing good work, but they can't yet show you a plan for how they'll scale up and what mm. they'll do with, with more money, uh, mightn't you just expect that if they have a good track record, they'll be able to find a way to, to, to use the money effectively? I think it's certainly possible. I think that uh, it depends a lot on the kind of group we're talking about. Particularly in, in many of the cases, we're considering pretty well-established groups where one or two of their programs have good track records and other programs don't. And so in those cases, we want to be very careful that we're only funding truly additional work and we're not just providing uh, money in the general pot that could, could go to ineffective work. And so in those cases, the room for more funding question becomes very important. The, uh, with, with a smaller group, certainly, I think we're more open to the philosophy of just backing them to do something. And, and it, the more that a group just has one program or does one thing, the easier that case is. The, so long as, as, as the argument they're making to us is just, we'll do more of this thing we're already doing well, that's a compelling case. You just mentioned kind of doing the maths, the, the cost-effectiveness analysis of the different kind of interventions that, that groups have. 
In your view, what, what are the most effective interventions for helping animals, and, and how confidently do we, do we have answers to that? Yeah, so right now it's a variety of confidence levels. So I'd say the, the intervention that I am most confident in right now are corporate campaigns because we can track so clearly the role of each advocacy group, the number of companies, the number of animals affected by each pledge, and then the subsequent implementation of those pledges. When it comes to other strategies, I think there's a lot of potential particularly where strategies focus on important areas and neglected areas, but it's going to be a lot harder to have confidence in the cost-effectiveness estimates we come up with. So, for instance, I feel very optimistic about focusing on China because of the number of animals there and because of the neglectedness, but I feel very low confidence in the cost-effectiveness estimates we've come up with just because we don't have a good sense for the tractability of those interventions yet. Mm. Are there any interventions that you think are especially uh, overrated? I do think that... uh, Traditionally, there was too much faith placed in online ads, so an in, in individual dietary change in general, trying to get people to go vegan. Mm-hmm. And that's not to say that individual dietary change cannot be an effective tactic. I think that it's totally possible that if done well, it can be, and there's a need for more research there. But I think there were a few uh, studies early on that gave misplaced confidence to advocates that online ads in particular, and leaflets too, were having an outsized impact on dietary change. And I think more rigorous studies since then have really suggested that that that, that was not the case and that we don't have a strong sense for the effectiveness of these interventions. Why do you think those studies uh, produce you know, positive results, perhaps, perhaps uh, excessively positive results? So the early studies were all done by advocacy groups in the space who had a very clear incentive. They also just weren't particularly well-designed studies. We didn't, some of the studies didn't have control groups. Some of the studies relied on the same volunteers who handed out the leaflets, going back and asking the people that handed leaflets to what effect it had on them. Uh, and in a lot of cases, the sample size was really small. So there were just the kind of classic problems we have with a study that doesn't have the kind of methodological safeguards that studies should have. Someone who had a lot of experience in social science research reading those papers would have realized that they weren't good at the time, it sounds like. Absolutely. And I think people did. I think that this has been a debate since these studies first came out. And and that's a big part of the reason why better studies were put into the field and why those better studies have now provided more caution. I think that some people got overly optimistic probably because they had good they had, they wanted to be. I mean, there's an ex- aspect of motivated reasoning here where it makes sense that you want this to be an effective intervention because it's relatively easy to do. And ultimately, you know, one of the most important things is can we get people to change their diets? Are there any really high-quality studies uh, coming out on those topics in future that will really allow us to settle that debate? I don't think there's something that will allow us to settle this debate yet, though, though maybe further down the line. The study that I'm most excited about recently was a study by a group called the Animal Welfare Action Lab. So this was a study done by Crystal Caldwell and Greg Boise and Bobby McDonald. And what they did was they had a group of MTurk respondents read articles about a general transition to veganism, about a general transition to reducitarianism, and a control article, I think, about global poverty. And they measured the effect of those articles simply on self-reported meat consumption and self-reported perceptions about animals, reducitarianism and veganism. And they found quite a robust, um, surprisingly robust impact, not only right afterwards, but also a month later. Um, And the reason I like the study is because it was, it really observed lots of good practices. So they, they had a, they, pre-registered the study, they put all the data online, they had a, an adequately powered sample, there was no pea fishing involved, it was just everything you'd want to see in a study. So we recently funded them to replicate or attempt to replicate this study on a larger scale using YouGov data rather than MTurk. And to me, it'll be really interesting to see whether that study replicates or whether it doesn't. But that's what I'd love to see more of, is that kind of study where it's, it's a strong study. It doesn't matter so much what the specifics of what it's measuring are, but that it really has some external validity. That sounds like a really exciting study. I'll see if, if, see if we can put up a link to that in the, in the show notes. Yeah, absolutely. Are there any things you've personally supported in the past, either financially or otherwise, that you've come to regret? I don't know if there are things that I've come to regret. I mean, I think that we've certainly had some grants that look likely to be 
failures. But I think that that's part of of taking higher risk bets. And so in some ways it would be concerning if we didn't have any failures. Mm. So I'm, I'm, I'm less, less kind of inclined to regret those. I mean, I also think it's the case that in the past for myself, I've, I've given funding to groups that I no longer think are effective. But again, I think it's probably normally more constructive to see that as a positive learning path, that you, you reach a point of, uh, of, of realizing these were ineffective and, and finding better ways to do things. So there's nothing you've personally done that you think uh, was, was stupid even at the time? Uh, not, not that immediately comes to mind, but I'm, I'm sure there's something out there. What are some of the most popular things that people do today in general to try to improve animal welfare? Well, I think if you look beyond the EA movement, the most popular thing is to help local groups helping cats and dogs. And while that obviously has positive direct benefits, I think in the greater scheme, it it doesn't have the same effectiveness as A, focusing on farm animals, and B, focusing on advocacy as opposed to direct care. So, and I think even within the farm animal side, you see a lot of people focusing on caring for farm animals, for instance, within sanctuaries. And though those can certainly be a useful advocacy or education tool, I think that has to be the focus. And oftentimes the focus instead becomes caring for farm animals, which again is, a, is very much a positive, but is not going to reach anything like the cost effectiveness of, of advocacy interventions. Looking at farm animal uh, welfare groups in, in particular, how does your portfolio of uh, you know, interventions that you fund uh, differ from what people are doing in general? I guess, what are the things that you've decided not to fund that, that you might have? I think the biggest thing we've decided not to fund that is, is widely done otherwise is individual dietary advocacy. So leafleting, online ads, uh, other forms of, of vegan outreach remain very common within the movement. And for us, we just don't feel like the evidence is there yet. It's, it's not that we think it could never be there, and it's not that we think people are necessarily wrong to be supporting those initiatives, but we just don't feel there's robust evidence there that would make us feel confident enough to support th- that kind of advocacy. Hmm. Let's talk a bit uh, for a moment about you personally. Uh, what in your background uh, put you in a good position to, to take the role that you have now? So I think this a program officer role is, is in many ways a generalist role where it's, it's really useful to have a broad background in research, in writing, in communication. So in some ways, I, I think of the extracurricular activities that I took. So for instance, I was very involved in debating through high school and through college. And I think that was a very useful activity for honing some of the analytical skills and communication skills that I, that I now use. I think a, a general liberal arts degree in the U.S. is also pretty pretty useful in terms of reading a wide variety of material, researching, putting together papers. I ultimately went to law school, and I, and I think that was useful in the sense that it, it also further honed my thinking process. I don't think it was necessary, though, and so I, I would say for people who are listening that if they want to perform a similar role, I'm not sure that law school is necessarily the right way to go about it. Mm. What's your accent? You, you sound Australian to me. <laughs> Almost. I'm from New Zealand. Okay, right. right, right. There's a lot of Australians and New Zealanders uh, seemingly involved in uh, effective altruism. Yeah, there are. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a funny uh, funny phenomenon. Yeah. Like, like Canadians, we're, we're everywhere we're walking among you. <laughs> um, do you think those uh, traits that you're um, looking for are kind of natural dispositional characteristics that don't change very much, or are they primarily uh, trainable? Are they things that people listening could, uh, could develop on their own? Yeah, I'm going to give the cop-out answer that it's both, yeah. but I, I do think that there are, there are definitely things that people can do to, to train for this. I, I think that just doing more rigorous research involving numbers, using data, understanding data, researching online to find essential facts, pulling them out, preparing reports. Uh, I think that that is is some of the best kind of training for for what we do. Um, I think, too, obviously evaluating charities. And so if if you also make your own personal donations, thinking hard about those and, and thinking about what numbers and what data should inform that, but also where you could gain more information and how that information would update your thinking and influence your decision. It looks like, uh, in terms of animal advocacy, you've only worked for the Humane Society of the US, is that right? That's right. 
Do you wish that you'd worked at a wider range of places to have a better sense of of the whole space? Yeah, I, I do. I mean, I think um, if, if nothing else, the uh, the optics would look better if I'd worked at more than one animal group. And I'm I'm certainly conscious to to not want to have favourites within the movement. I think that one of the nice things about farm animal welfare is it's still a pretty small movement and a very closely connected one. So I've really had the opportunity to get to know people across all of the groups and and to get some sense at least of of what they do. But I I do think that there is a lot of value to people uh, getting experience in multiple related jobs or domains. And and so certainly within animal welfare, I think there'd be a lot of value to people working working for multiple groups. You worked at Bain & Company uh, for a while. Was that your first job out of university? That was, yeah. Okay. Yeah, taking working working in consulting for a couple of years is one of the, the parts that we've recommended, uh, although because so many people have done it, we've started to, to back away from that lately because we're worried that we're getting saturated with that. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, at least soon we'll be saturated by ex-management mm-hmm. consultants. Mm-hmm. Uh, is that something that you would recommend? Do you think that that added a lot of skills? For myself, I don't think it did. Uh, I can certainly see it making a lot of sense to someone, particularly, obviously, if you're looking to earn to give. It can be a useful launching plan for lucrative careers. I think that if you're looking to work in management with a nonprofit, then then there are some really useful skills and, and analytical skills, certainly, that are brought to bear. For myself, my my feeling is that I mainly did this as a sort of uh, cop out because I wasn't yet ready to go and work full time on animal advocacy, and because I came into the job market during the depression, and so it was kind of exciting just to have a job in New York. But I, um, I generally think I ended up only working there for a year, and I, I'm not really, I don't really believe that in that time I gained a lot of useful skills. I think I mainly gained a lot of information about very particular business sectors, uh, which would be useful if I wanted to go and work in those business sectors. But uh, otherwise, I'm not sure it's completely generalizable. It sounded like you also regretted doing law school, or potentially now you've you've ended up developing some skills that are somewhat stranded given where you've mm-hmm. gone with your career. Why did you go to law school at the time? Yeah, so I'm not sure I'd say I regret law school, but I but I would say that I don't necessarily recommend it to others. Uh, you know, at the time, I think that um, law school appeared to be the obvious route toward effective advocacy, and I think that for a lot of uh, people in America in particular focused on, on social change, it's natural to look to the courts because this was the successful route of civil rights, this was the successful route of gay rights. Unfortunately, I think it's very unlikely to be the successful route for animal welfare or, for that matter, for other EA causes. And so when I went to law school, I think I just had this inclination that generally lawyers are in a good position to bring about social change. And it was only once I started working as a lawyer at the Humane Society on Factory Farming that I realized the legal opportunities are very limited on this issue. And so, again, I, I think not necessarily a mistake in that I, I gained useful skills. Uh, the credentials were probably helpful in gaining this, this current job. But I, I do think that for people who are thinking about how they can have the greatest impact, it's, it's often people look far too quickly at law school on, on social change issues rather than looking at where their comparative advantage lies. I want to spend the next half an hour to perhaps 45 minutes working through a bunch of specific different approaches that people might take to help animals. And given that you were talking just then about legal advocacy, maybe let's dive into that uh, a little bit more. Why is it that legal advocacy uh, isn't such a promising avenue for uh, helping animals? The biggest constraint on legal advocacy is the lack of laws to be used or enforced. So within the United States, there are only two federal laws that apply to farm animals. And both of them are only enforceable via the Department of Agriculture or prosecutors. So there's, there's no private citizen suit, no way that individuals can, can help enforce them. And they're, they're both very minimal legal protections. Similarly, at the state level, the, the very minimal protections that do exist first normally exempt farm animals from their protections or agricultural practices from their protections. But secondly, don't provide any means of civil enforcement. So what you're really looking at is a system that's set up to only be used by district attorneys or U.S. attorneys. Unfortunately, most of the district attorneys in the areas where factory farming is tend to be very tight with those communities who are often elected positions. So your ability as an independent litigator to make an impact is extremely limited. And the further constraint is the constraint of standing, which is that in U.S. courts, to be able to litigate on an issue, you need to show a, a concrete harm to yourself. And it's not sufficient to show a concrete harm to an animal or to show an animal cruelty harm that might affect you. 
And so that makes it very hard to get into court in the first place, even when there's a law you can use and a clear legal violation you could show. Who would have standing? Would it be other farms that are trying to compete with that farm and are following the regulations? Sometimes, yeah. So it depends a lot on the law being used. The problem is that often no one has standing, which is why a lot of these laws go completely unenforced. Seems like an oversight on the part of the legislators. You, you could see it as an oversight or you could see it as intentional. I, I, I tend to think that in a lot of these cases... Agri- animal agriculture has been very careful that they, they don't want to see laws on the books enforced. And in the few occasions where these laws have started to be enforced, they've often come in and amended the laws to prevent their enforcement. So I, I think that standing doctrine, and, and this is, has been across multiple areas, certainly across environmentalism and, and other areas where it's not directly individuals who are affected, there's been a concerted effort by industry to increase the requirements for standing doctrine, to make it harder for people to get into court in the first place. I guess this allows them to say, oh, look at these very strict regulations that are on the books that we have to follow, uh, or at least like there's some regulations, mm-hmm. but then, of course, they're, they're not enforced at all, so they can basically do whatever they want. Yeah, that's right. So a lot of U.S. factory farming companies like to say that they're compliant with all U.S. laws and regulations. And there are virtually no U.S. laws and regulations, and it's, it's not at all clear that they are compliant with them. But they're correct in stating that no one is prosecuting them for violating them uh, because of the, the total lack of enforcement of those laws. What about in the EU or the UK or possibly New Zealand? Uh, are there more promising avenues for uh, legal ad- advocacy there? I think there might be. So I, I haven't looked as deeply into legal opportunities in those countries. Certainly in the UK and in the European Union, there are stronger laws uh, protecting farm animals. At the European Union level, there are a number of, of quite powerful directives. I don't think that there is an ability for a citizen suit to enforce any of those laws, but it does seem like there's a more functional political system in which lobbying and and working with regulators is more likely to have an impact. I know that there has also been attempts at uh, litigation in Australia and New Zealand around animal welfare. I'm not sure how successful it's been to date, but it does seem that there are fewer barriers than there are in the United States. There's also groups like the Non-Human Rights Project, uh, and I think you know groups that have advocated on behalf of you know killer whales in in farms, or I guess the, the Great Ape Rights Project. I don't know mm-hmm. exactly what it's called, mm-hmm. but uh, they get a lot of attention, I suppose. Mm-hmm. That you know I've seen them regularly, you know, on the front page of the New York mm-hmm. Times. So they might be seen just as a legal approach to getting a lot of publicity and, mm-hmm. and engaging in advocacy that people read about. Uh, what, what do you think about those? So I I think they've been very effective in getting publicity, and I hope that that publicity has started to make people reflect more on the legal lines we draw around humans and and keeping out animals. My my concern is is firstly that I think it, it is very hard for those groups to succeed in the current legal system, and I think they would acknowledge that, that the standing doctrines and just the lack of laws to be enforced mean that they're forced to really ask judges to go out on to, to kind of go out on a, on a plank for them. The uh, other issue that that I always think about is is how much how likely is this to help farm animals down the line? And to me, it's it's quite conceivable that society will expand our moral circle or our legal circle to include chimpanzees, to include orcas, to include elephants and other cognitively sophisticated mammals, but will still feel completely capable of excluding chickens or fish or other animals that that don't have the same claim to legal personhood based on cognitive ability or something similar. A a related approach that a number of people who we both know uh, are working on is kind of radical vegan advocacy, where you really get in people's faces and and you have a very strong message and your goal is to kind of shock people into a paradigm shift where they realize that uh, cruelty towards animals or just, uh, you know, speciesism uh, is, is, a, is a really important issue. And you maybe hope to get, get a dramatic shift in attitudes in society in the way that we've perhaps seen with feminism or with civil rights in the past. What do you think about, about those approaches? My, my general inclination is that it's, it's too early for society to be receptive to such radical advocacy. And I think when you look at past social movements, it normally came at a point where far more of society was on board. For instance, with the civil rights movement, 
you had a far larger portion of US population actively supporting the movement. And then it was it was the use of more radical tactics to really get the salience on the issue and to get people riled up. But I, I, I do think that this is something that is very open for research. So I think that this would be, be a great thing for people to test with studies, whether confrontation is effective or not. The one thing I would say is that I think that confrontational tactics often uh, become confrontational against other activists, and it seems very likely to me that it's counterproductive to spend some portion, or in many cases most, of an activist's time fighting other activists or convincing other activists that they're wrong. Animal advocacy seems really quite distinctive in just how much infighting there is and how much you have groups... uh, set up almost seemingly for the purpose of attacking other groups within the same very niche mm. cause. What's going on there? Yeah, it's, uh, it's confusing. I think, uh, I think that it is, it is natural given that it is a source of such strong feelings. And, and I can understand having kind of been so angry and upset myself when I found out about factory farming. I mean, I think there's a realisation when you find out about the scale and the degree of mistreatment of, of animals by humans there's a real desire to be to be angry about that and to be annoyed at the world. And I think that oftentimes activists first express that anger or frustration toward general society, and then when they find that general society won't listen, they'll direct it toward those who will listen, which is to say other activists or companies that are trying to do higher welfare policies. And I think that it makes sense that given we have such strong emotions as activists on this issue, it it makes sense that even relatively small tactical disagreements can quickly become moral disagreements or or become moral judgments on one another. So I think it's natural, and and I do think that there are parallels in past movements. I think if you look at, for instance, the US anti-slavery movement, there were similarly virulent disagreements within the movement. Uh, That said, I think it's definitely counterproductive, and and I'm hopeful it, it does seem that the the divisions within the movement are slowly uh, dissipating over time, and and so I'm hopeful that that trend will continue. It seems to me like you should try to implement a really strong norm within that group of just basically not aggressively uh, criticising other activists at all, just because the history has been that it's been so so destructive, and people are just fairly rarely persuaded uh, by using those means seems to me. Yeah. Yes, I completely agree with you. I think the uh, the challenge is that as a funder, we we certainly will only fund groups that don't spend their time or funds attacking other groups. But th- that leaves us in a position with really no leverage over those activists and groups who are doing that. So, Well, I guess you might hope that um, as a result they would shrink as a fraction of the movement. I, and I think that's happening. I think that that is, is one of the things that is, that is already happening. And, and I certainly think I've been happy to see that a number of funders feel the same way, that they will only fund groups that, that don't spend time attacking other groups. The, uh, I think that there is still the potential for a relatively small number of people and a small portion of the movement to do a lot of harm to other groups. But I completely agree that whatever we can to establish a norm that uh, does not include attacking other groups, that includes, wherever possible, cooperating with them and supporting them, uh, that would be very positive. I guess we wouldn't want to preclude the, the option of explaining why you're doing what you're doing and saying, you know, I think other people should, in some cases in some cases stop using interventions that don't work and, and switch over to, to these other approaches in a, in a way that's polite and, mm-hmm. and evidence-based because, of course, that's the kind of thing that, that you and I would be doing and, and trying, to, trying to accomplish. Yeah, that's right. And I think, it's, uh, I, think, I think that's absolutely the case. I mean, I think, for instance, you know, when we made our original uh, cage-free grants, uh, Direct Action Everywhere published a post criticizing them, and I'm, I'm glad they did. I think that that is exactly the kind of respectful disagreement and debate you want to see. And we, we do need to have that kind of lively debate within the movement. We do need to have sort of settled positions criticized, conventional wisdom questioned. So I think it's, I think it's absolutely great to have that kind of debate. And I think that the, the object should be kind of setting the norm in such a way that that kind of debate is possible, but actively sabotaging other groups' campaigns and work is, is not. Can you tell us more about your work funding uh, funding groups overseas? Um, so you funded China, and what, what were the other countries? Again? We funded now in China, in India, in Brazil, in a number of European countries, the UK and, and Germany, um, and we have indirectly 
funded advocacy across a number of other countries via regranting. Hmm. How do you go about finding these groups? I mean, I imagine you only speak English, or I speak <laughs> English and perhaps Spanish. Eh? Uh, yeah, unfortunately, I only speak English. Uh, the the largest, the, the most useful thing I have found has been networking for people who I already know. So talking to US-based activists and asking their recommendations for people in other countries, or talking to people who I already know in other countries and asking their recommendations for activists. But even just online research has has turned out to be surprisingly useful. So for instance, with our China grants, we ended up supporting 10 groups. I'd say of those groups, I was already connected with about three of them. And through those connections was put in touch with another three. But the remaining four were all just things that I found online by kind of exhaustively searching for reports and for everything I could find on the work being done in China and just reaching out to those groups cold. So that that's often the way. In the case of our grants in India, I actually traveled to India and met with about 25 different activists representing different groups and certainly found that to be a very useful uh, a very useful tool. And so I think it's quite likely we're, we're hopefully going to recommend a set of grants in Europe. And for that set of grants, I also recently went over to Europe and met with a number of groups. So I think that is an increasingly useful tool to actually meet with groups. But where that's not possible, certainly I'm always trying to talk over Skype, have phone conversations, and as much as possible, vetting one group via multiple different independent sources. So really asking everyone about everyone else to get a kind of as independent a sense as possible of what's going on. Have you had to reduce your standards for quality of evidence in order to find granting opportunities overseas? Yes, definitely. So I I would say, for instance, that in China, our standard for quality of evidence is significantly lower than it is in the United States. But it's compensated for by the fact that the the problem is so neglected over there that perhaps even even a worse project or a more risky project is still worth going for. Yeah, that's the thinking. And and, and I think it could fall into either bucket, right? I mean, it, it, it could be that projects are worse, and, and I'm certainly open to us supporting worse projects in a country where I think it's really important to get things going. But I think it's also, as you say, just riskier because in a lot of these cases, it's projects without track records. So we're talking about a project where we can't find clear evidence on what it's done in the past, or whether it's been effective, but we know that it's operating in an important area, we know that it's neglected, and, and that can really start to make the case. What's the nature of animal advocacy in India? Is it often religiously motivated? So there's certainly a, a religious subcurrent. I, I was quite happy in traveling to India to see that there is a very clear distinction between the animal advocacy movement and the Hindu fundamentalist movement. And so a lot of the headlines you'll see about cow protection laws and, and preventing the slaughter of cows most Indian animal advocates want nothing to do with that. They, they understand, first of all, that it's, it's really just a pretext for anti-Muslim bigotry, but that, secondly, it's probably bad for animal welfare. I mean, what happens when these slaughter bans get passed at the same time as the Indian dairy industry is rapidly growing is huge numbers of surplus cows that can't be legally slaughtered, so they're either smuggled long distances to be slaughtered, or they're dumped in these sanctuaries where they will slowly die or won't receive medical treatment. So I think that there is a real understanding amongst Indian animal advocates of that. It's certainly true that the Hindu nationalists right now have a lot more political power than the animal advocates do, but there is also a really strong cultural and historical current of animal protection in India. So it goes back to the promotion of vegetarianism by Ashoka and others early on in Indian history. Is it Jainism as well? Jainism as well, certainly. Jainism has has a very strong current on this. Really all of India's religions do. But something which is remarkable to me is that India's constitution includes animal welfare protections. And right after independence, India passed a very strong animal cruelty law. Now, there are still major problems with enforcement of that law, But the fact that it has on the books laws that are far stronger than what the U.S. has and really stronger even than many European countries uh, suggests to me that there's a lot of potential there once those laws are enforced to actually see really high standards in India. Is it fair to say that India morally is just ahead of, uh, you know, Europe and and the U.S. in in this respect? Uh, Like, culturally, are those values widespread? You know, I I can't really speak to how widespread those values are. I haven't seen any good public opinion surveys on the issue. And so I think certainly within the Indian elite, these values seem a lot stronger 
than they seem amongst the elites in other countries. Mm. I think the other thing is there's far less of a countervailing lobby. There just doesn't seem to be the same kind of organised lobby in favour of factory farming or other abuses of animals. So that that seems pretty important. Um, but but I do certainly I do certainly see really really promising trends in terms of even amongst the Indian population there seems to be some broad degree of concern about animal welfare. What about countries that are majority uh, Buddhist? Uh, mm-hmm. I mean, Buddhism, uh, I'm not an expert on this, but my understanding is it regards vegetarianism as uh, a noble thing to do, mm-hmm. though in, for, for, in most countries it's not regarded as, as obligatory. But in some uh, strains of Buddhism, particularly in China, it is generally regarded as obligatory or something that, that most Buddhists mm-hmm. uh, would be doing, but it, but it varies country to country. Uh, does that provide potentially a foundation for you know spreading uh, humane values much more broadly? I, I think it might, and I, and I've, this is certainly something we've been looking into a bit. I mean, it's certainly the case that the majority of Japanese are Buddhist, large portion of the Chinese population are Buddhist, and as you say, this is a religion whose precepts involve doing no active harm to other sentient beings. So I think there is a strong ideal of non-harm within that religion, and what you'll often see is even within subsets of the religion or within regions where not everyone is vegetarian, the monks or the nuns normally still are vegetarian. And so there's there's definitely a sense that this is, is what you should strive toward. I think it's also a very tough thing to get involved with religious advocacy. So and and often a very sensitive thing. So I mean for instance in China, uh, we don't want to be in the business of, of being seen as as sort of religious advocates. I think it's even more sensitive than being seen as civil advocates. But my hope is that there are things we can do to bolster those voices already within the Buddhist um, movement, within the Buddhist religion, that are promoting vegetarianism or that are promoting a stronger degree of respect for for other sentient beings to really encourage their voices and to give them the resources to elevate their voices to. It occurs to me that that could potentially even be a cost-effective thing to do, even setting aside animals, that... uh Buddhism seems to have values, I think, that are closer to mine than than most religions. And uh, in as much as there's a there's a huge population there that could be motivated to you know, think in a more effective altruist way and might be quite receptive because it's quite compatible with some mm-hmm. of the underlying ideas of the religion. Maybe there's just some good opportunities there. Yeah, I think it's a really interesting question. I mean, I think it's. Um, I would certainly defer more to to experts on the theology and and on the uh <laughs> I probably should as well. <laughs> yeah well, and, I, I've read the wikipedia page to be fair <laughs> yeah and I, I mean I, I I do think that there is an aspect of uh a, a lot of of religions have some really good things on paper I mean not just about animals but about for instance charitable giving and the the obligation to care for the poor and to care for the sick and it's really a question about whether people actually implement implement those in practice. But I, I do think that there is a lot of room for effective altruism to connect more with religious communities in general and to really connect more, too, with those teachings that are very deep in some religions that really do try to promote altruism and, and doing good for others. I might be judging Buddhism by a different standard because it's uh, <laughs> further away from what I'm used to. So you judge things that are near right. to you by uh, by what they actually are, and things that are far away by right. what, what they what they supposed to be. But yeah. Earlier, you mentioned Brazil and South America. Um, I've, I've I've been to Central America, and it doesn't seem like animal advocacy is a huge thing there. <laughs> people, right. people really love their meat. What, what what's the story with animal advocacy there? Yeah. So Latin America has been a real bright spot and a real a real pleasant surprise. So. Some of this came out of initially just talking to uh, Mercy for Animals, which had been placing online ads in multiple countries around the world, and just seeing what the click-through rate was like, how much they had to pay to get a click, how much, um, and then what that click led to, how much time the person spent on the website, whether they requested a vegetarian starter guide, and so on. And the metrics were just hugely better in Latin America than anywhere else. So, for instance, compared to the U.S., they were getting click-through rates that were five, six times higher. They were getting people spending much more time on the website. And we've really seen more of that as we've, as we've started to support more advocacy in these countries, particularly in Brazil and Mexico, just because they're, they're the largest countries in Latin America. We've seen a lot of receptiveness, a lot of, of people getting engaged in Facebook campaigns. Uh, companies, often surprisingly receptive to going cage-free or making animal welfare reforms. And politicians now starting to really discuss this as an issue. So 
I don't know what the story is there behind that, but I think that it that part of it is is that there really were a lot of activists and a lot of sympathy beneath the surface, but there just previously hadn't been the resources mm. to mobilize that. And so it sort of started at a head start compared to other countries. Hmm. That's it's quite surprising because I think mm-hmm. you'd face significant headwinds there. Uh, one, uh, animal welfare seems to be a bigger deal in, say, Northern Europe mm. than, than Southern Europe, Sorry. and Latin America seems to have more of a like Italian and kind of Spanish style culture mm-hmm. and, and, and historical uh, pedigree. Uh, and you've got like the, the Catholicism, which mm-hmm. isn't inconsistent, but also doesn't seem to push animal welfare mm-hmm. that hard. Plus, like maybe a more macho culture than mm-hmm. than you would think uh, in like Northern Northern Europe. And and yet it's it's more effective there than, than in the US. I suppose one thing is like the ads might be cheaper per impression because uh, the people aren't as wealthy. Right, right. So the ads are, ads are cheaper, but quite separately from that, the click through rates are better, and and the time spent and so on is better. The I mean I, I don't want to overstate how rosy the picture is. There's certainly still widespread factory farming, and and it is the case too that. Uh, some companies have proven very resistant to change. And and some of them, because there aren't the kind of free speech protections there are in the US, some of them have sued activists for campaigning and and tried to really squelch their campaigning. So well, that's happened in the US as well. That has happened in the US as well, yeah. Um, the uh, so so I think that there's I think it's a mixed picture in Latin America. I guess to me it's it's mainly optimistic relative to my baseline assumption. Yeah. Uh, less optimistic just kind of objectively. It's really good that it was tried out because mm-hmm. I guess you have these you know stereotypes about right. different countries that are based on you know not not all that much experience, just like people's very broad impressions, and uh, yeah. it sounds like it doesn't always match uh, the actual experience. Yeah, I think that's a great point. I mean, I think that particularly when it comes to a pretty new issue like animal welfare, that isn't very well correlated with, for instance, political left and right or or other kind of standard things we know more about. It, it makes a lot of sense to just test it, to see, to test the message, to test in different countries and different places and see what works. And I think we're constantly kind of surprised by, by what that is. One possibility is that people in the US are already familiar with the fact that people care about animal welfare and advocate vegetarianism. They, they've at least heard of it, even if mm-hmm. they haven't heard all the details. So possibly they're just sick of it and they, and they know what the ad is going to be about and they don't want to read it again. But in South America, it just might be a more novel thing. So people are curious to find out. That's that's definitely one plausible explanation, and I think another um, set of results consistent with that that I heard recently was a group in Australia uh, was testing online ads with different demographics, and traditionally we've thought of young people as being the most receptive demographic, but what they found was that old people clicked on their ads far more often, spent far more time on their website, and based on a very kind of loose subjective interpretation of comments, left far more favorable comments. <laughs> uh, and again, that may just have a lot more to do with the fact that this was an audience that hadn't been exposed to this message previously. So you both have a set of low-hanging fruit that, that hasn't already been grabbed, but you also have people who are really just, there's more of an interest factor. There's more of a new, unique factor here. Maybe they're just less easily distracted than, than, than the kids who are, you know, interrupting their, their reading about animal welfare to check Snapchat. I don't know. <laughs> that too, that too. All right, as, as we continue our march through each of the different intervention areas, uh, let's talk a bunch about uh, corporate campaigns. Can, can you describe in detail the approach that um, these campaigns are taking to try to influence corporate behavior? Sure. So the basic premise of these campaigns is that the manner in which farm animals are treated is really oblivious to the customers of grocery stores or fast food chains or, or other companies that are using these animal products. And in most cases, when consumers find out how those animals are treated, they're not very happy about it. It's not consistent with their expectations and, and their faith in the company. So what these campaigns do is really seek to capitalize on that dissonance They seek to make customers of companies aware how the animals in the chain are treated and to thus really create a PR incentive or a brand incentive for the companies to do something about it, to deal with that dissonance, to avoid the consumer backlash and to really avoid the significant negative publicity from just simple exposure of how they're treating the animals in their supply chain. Mm. And so they, uh, they they describe the conditions of the animals to, to the general public and try to get it in the media and then say, we'll stop doing this and we'll stop complaining if you change what you stock or how you produce uh, eggs? Yeah. So, I mean, a lot of it is, is more finding particular leverage points. Okay. So it's, for instance, finding first making sure that the uh, company's senior management and, and their investors are aware of how the animals are being treated 
and oftentimes that's enough. They, they aren't even aware, and when they see it, they either feel terrible about it or they recognize a major brand liability waiting to happen. Uh, if, if that fails, then yes, launching campaigns, uh, certainly generating media publicity, generating a lot of online uh, feedback, and so making sure that consumers are really communicating with this company how annoyed they are about this, communicating through Facebook, through Twitter, through phone calls to the company, and then doing things like targeted protests to really make uh, the company's consumers aware of this, in particular locales, to make it a hassle for the company and to make them really deal and, and interact with the issue. Most of these campaigns have been about Cage versus uh, Barn Lead or Free Range Eggs, right? Yeah, so the, the first round of, of campaigns, which are just now winding up in the US, have focused on eliminating the use of battery cages for layer hands. Uh, that's now the primary focus of campaigns in Latin America and in Southern Europe. In the US and in Northern Europe, where those campaigns have largely been won in the sense of securing uh, pledges from across the industry, activists have now moved on to the treatment of broiler chickens, uh, the meat chickens, which are raised separately from, from layer hens, and in particular are focused on reforming their genetics, the amount of space they have, so the, the, the crowding, and slaughter methods and other living conditions. So what do you mean uh, changing their genetics? So one of the biggest problems that modern broiler chickens face is the genetics that they're born with. Those genetics have been optimized for two things only, for as rapid a growth as possible and for as low a feed conversion ratio as possible. And in the process, animal welfare has been really neglected. And so what we have now is birds that grow five, six times faster than they did in uh, 1950, but the birds' systems are not designed to keep up with that. So their legs aren't five to six times stronger, their lungs and heart aren't five to six times bigger. And so what you end up with is a lot of birds lame later in in the uh, growing period. You end up with birds with major respiratory problems, with heart problems. So a lot of sources of real kind of chronic suffering that are created simply by the genetics these birds are born with. Uh, it's, it sounds perverse, but could, could that even have been positive for animal welfare? Because uh, like, th- their lives are worse, but there's also you need fewer of them to produce the same amount of meat. On the other hand, of course, uh, the meat uh, becomes cheaper then, and so mm-hmm. people consume more of it. But it's, I guess it's not obvious that it's harmful overall. Yeah, so this is certainly a, a debate that's been had around the, the current requests for higher welfare genetics, which may mean slower genetics. Mm. And and to me, I think the most important thing is that when we're talking about higher welfare genetics, the focus is on those welfare outcomes. And so I think if you look at, at the current outcomes for broiler chickens, uh, it seems very likely that they live net negative lives, mm. as opposed to in 1950, where I think it's totally conceivable that they had net positive lives. And so if you're talking about net positive versus net negative, then extending a net positive life isn't, isn't such a bad thing, whereas extending uh, a net negative life is a very bad thing. Um, but, I, but I think, you know, the, when we look at these um, welfare outcomes, whether it's lameness, whether it's respiratory problems, it's not the case that we need to reverse all the genetic changes made since 1950. So we don't need to make birds grow five to six times slower. Just reducing the growth rate by something like 25% can make a major difference. And the biggest reason for that is not the actual growth rate itself, but is that at every stage in breeding chickens, the genetics companies only have so much genetic variation to play with. Mm-hmm. And what they've been doing with these high-performing bird ranges is selecting solely based on these two characteristics of growth and feed conversion. So when you free up some of that genetic potential and they're instead able to select based on animal welfare factors, you end up with a significantly higher welfare bird without doing a lot to sacrifice that growth rate. Could we take that even further and ultimately make animals that have just amazing lives, that, that are just constantly ecstatic, like they're on, I don't know, heroin or, <laughs> or some other drug that makes mm-hmm. people feel very good uh, just, just all the time whenever they're in the farm and then say, well, the problem has basically been solved because the animals are living great lives? Yeah, so I think this is a really interesting kind of ethical question for people about whether that would, in people's minds, solve the problem. I think from a pure utilitarian perspective, it would. A lot of people, I think, would would find that kind of perverse, having, uh, having, for instance, particularly, I think, if you're talking about animals that might psychologically feel good, even in in terrible conditions. Mm. 
I think the reason why it's probably going to remain a thought experiment, though, is that it ultimately relies on the chicken genetics companies and the chicken producers to be on board. And not only have they shown very little interest in improving chicken welfare or improving chicken well-being, I mean, it's a fight just to get them to agree on the most basic reforms, but they also seem far more concerned about being able to say to their consumer that a chicken isn't technically genetically modified, which the sort of changes you're envisaging would probably involve some form of genetic modification. Mm -hmm. So it, it's funny given that they've done so much to genetically manipulate these birds and to do far more than uh, GMO technologies could have done in like one swoop. Quite ghastly things. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, but they still maintain this real, you know, they want the consumer still to mm -hmm. feel the kind of naturalistic fallacy about these birds. I was thinking you, you could just use the same breeding techniques to select the birds that seem to be happiest. I guess you'd have a problem there between seeming happy and being happy. Uh, you could end you, up breaking that link. But. So, so, yeah, I mean, I think that certainly when you're talking about higher welfare outcomes, one of them is to, to look at the sort of perceived subjective well-being of birds. It's quite hard to measure. They, they, birds don't smile in the same way as we do, and we don't have the same kind of insights into their minds and, and when they're happy or not. But I think the bigger issue there is that for birds to truly be happy in the kind of environments they're being kept in would require far more than you could naturally select for. So, okay. the, the, or it would take thousands of generations or just, just it, a, a it, huge amount of evolution it, for that to work. Yeah, and, and might still not be possible. I mean, <laughs> sort of, there are some basic evolutionary reasons why you would find really harsh, unforgiving environments uh, to make you unhappy. You know, I mean, there are reasons why this should be aversive for an animal evolutionarily. Although... Well, I'm, I'm not so sure about that. I, I studied genetics, and I'm, mm -hmm. and I'm just thinking, uh, in, in fact, these environments aren't bad for them in the modern world, in a sense, because they they get food uh, and, and they reproduce. Uh, it's in a way that there's a disconnect between um, how they've what they've been evolved to want in the past mm -hmm. and, in fact, what actually perpetuates their, their, their genes today. Uh, so it would certainly would require a radical reprogramming mm -hmm. of what kind of environments uh, chickens enjoy. But there's mm -hmm. there's other species that like kind of cramped, damp mm -hmm. conditions. I don't know. Uh, but, I mean, it's insects, obviously, uh, mm -hmm. but like burrowing animals. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, I think you're certainly right that the, the biggest problem here is the imbalance between these animals' needs as they've sort of were naturally and have been developed through breeding and the environments they're in. And, and despite the best efforts of farmers to kind of breed the original animal out of them, they have not gotten to a point where birds, for instance, don't feel the desire to extend their wings or, or to perch or to dust bathe or do other things that are severely constrained in these environments. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll defer to you on whether you could ever <laughs> breed a bird yeah. like that, but but I do think that the simplest solution is likely to be to yeah. just improve the conditions sufficiently mm. that uh, the bird is able to exhibit those kind of important behaviours. Another reason that this approach might be redundant is that I expect that it would be more difficult and take longer than producing uh, meat, cultured meat, or uh, other other um, you know uh, meat substitutes that don't require animals. Yeah, I think that's a great point. I mean, I think when people start to talk about completely re-engineering the minds of chickens so that they're essentially brain dead and, and don't realize the environment they're in, it just seems like a better option to only grow the meat part of the yeah. bird and not grow the mind at all. I expect that is probably coming in the next 30 to 50 years, possibly even sooner than that. Uh, and, and it's clear that, that, that there's a commercial path to doing mm -hmm. that in a way that probably just doesn't exist for these radical changes in bird genetics. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, people always talk about consume, hurdles to consumer acceptance of, of growing meat or clean meat. But obviously those hurdles would be far greater for brain-dead meat or uh, otherwise significantly altered chicken. So, so I do think that, as you say, it's, it's most likely we will see this through people just growing the meat cells themselves. And, and that also seems more efficient than growing the entire bird. It's strange that that would have hurdles to consumer acceptance, but birds that are so large that their legs break and then they starve and rot on the floor of the farm, uh, not so much. <laughs> yeah, it's a real irony. I mean, it, it really is kind of crazy how so many of the, when, when there are surveys done, questions about would people eat grown meat, and people say they wouldn't because it's not natural. And that's, you know, when you look at the current system, if natural is even is, is a good thing that you care about, there, there is just no way you would assign natural as the descriptor of the current system. So I think that has a lot to do with, with willful ignorance of current conditions. And, and my hope is certainly that as the animal movement does a better job of raising awareness of actual conditions with people, 
that will make them more receptive to alternatives like growing meat, which they'll they'll come to see are, are really in, you know both cleaner in terms of how they're produced, but also just obviously so much better for animals. We just had a lengthy diversion into genetics, mm. uh, but we were talking about uh, corporate campaigns and yeah. their approach. I wanted to discuss for a minute the the economics of the uh, cage free campaigns. Mm-hmm. So. They put pressure on these companies and they mm. inform them uh, of some moral suasion and some just uh, profit-based mm-hmm. uh, suasion. Yeah. And many of them are folded quite quickly. Mm-hmm. Is that because it's not that much more expensive to get rid of the cages? Or is it that consumers kind of wanted it anyway? Or perhaps if everyone's doing it at once, you don't get much of a commercial disadvantage? I think it's a variety of those factors. But I actually think, I think more than that, that these campaigns have just been very effectively run. I mean, the... Um, I think the most important factor behind these campaigns is that they have never given up a campaign until they've won. So if you think about the proposition as a company, when one of these campaigning groups comes to you and says, hey, you're doing this cruel practice, we're planning to campaign against you, as that company you face a choice. If you know that they have never backed out of a campaign, they have ultimately won every campaign, even if it's taken them a year or longer, you face a choice of either we can do this right now and incur whatever cost there is down the line and possibly get a mild kind of positive halo for for doing a good thing, or we can endure a brutal campaign where our brand gets trashed for weeks, months, or even a year, and then we can end up doing the same thing with the same cost associated to it. So when you see it in that way, it becomes pretty rational to make that decision. And I think that one way they've been able to really build up their reputation has been going through industry subsector at a time. So starting out with food service companies and really creating the place where after Aramark and Compass Group had made these commitments, for Sodexo, they were the only other major food service company that hadn't, and they risked becoming the pariah within their industry. And similarly doing that within fast food, food fat manufacturers, grocers. So I, I think definitely building up the kind of momentum within each industry has been really important, and there is a kind of herd mentality that occurs. But I also think there's a basic kind of rational calculus for companies. Yeah. Are the campaigners going to make sure that they never drop a campaign, that they're going to just, if they, if they start something, they're going to finish it? That's the plan. And uh, the, so far, they, they've held true to that. I mean, there are campaigns that have, have been going on for quite a while, uh, more than some that have been going on for more than six months. But almost invariably, I mean, invariably, other than the current few campaigns that are going on, they have ultimately won. And and I think that uh, normally over time, they either kind of wear down a company or they experiment and ultimately find the pressure points that uh, really get to the company and make them want to want to compromise. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, that, that really has been their track record to date. What is the kind of first email or letter that they send to the company? Is it very friendly and informative and all, my, all smiles and cheer? <laughs> so, so I'm not involved in, in the tactics, yeah. but my understanding is that, yes, the, the, the initial communications are always as friendly mm-hmm. and polite as possible. So there, there really is an effort to kind of appeal to the better angels of, of the executive's nature. The, uh, and, and sometimes it works. I mean, really, sometimes it is the case that what, what happens here is that executives of the company simply didn't realize. And it sounds crazy, but you think, you know, if you're running a, a large food manufacturing company and just a few of your products have eggs in them, it's totally possible that you just don't know how those eggs are produced. Yeah. And so it's sometimes the case that when the executives find out how they're produced, they're shocked and they want nothing to do with it. Um, and I think it's also sometimes the case that executives, even just receiving that polite email, see the potential brand damage for when consumers will do this. And so that's sufficient. So, so yeah, it starts out, I think, normally with a pretty polite, nice approach. And they kind of go in order from companies that seem either most culturally receptive or that their brand uh, is most likely to be damaged because they have, you know, a brand that says that, you know, we're a nice, friendly, environmentally Mm -hmm. positive company. Or, or, or do they go to companies where it's, it's not costly for them because the eggs, say, are only a small fraction of the product cost? Uh, what, what's the calculus? So certainly they're looking for the low-hanging fruit at first. But ultimately they know they need to get through the entire food industry. So you ultimately need to get pledges from even the toughest companies at some point. So generally I think that there has been a tendency with each of these corporate campaigns first to focus on the food service sector. And the reason for that is that it's a highly competitive sector where accounts, where, where the companies are constantly competing for accounts. What do you mean food service sector? So food service, Compass Group, Aramark, Sodexo, these are the companies that serve all the food served at universities, in hospitals, in office cafeterias. And each of those universities or office cafeterias is viewed as an account. 
And so what happens is when a campaign starts and when the Humane League, for instance, is able to mobilise students at campuses across the country, they're not just protesting against Aramark, they're petitioning their university to drop Aramark as their food service provider because of its mistreatment of animals. And given this is a high margin, highly competitive business for companies like Aramark, they're very sensitive to that. And so they want to fulfill what those customers are demanding and want to avoid that kind of negative publicity. So that's one example of, of how they start. So a lot of, uh, a lot of companies are switching from cage eggs to non-cage eggs, but what are the conditions uh, once they get out of the cages? Yes, so they're certainly far from perfect. Typically what the difference looks like is this, is that in a caged operation, the average bird in the United States is in a cage with between four and six other birds. In that cage, they have about 67 square inches, so that's about the size of uh, an iPad, uh, and that's where they spend their whole life. And there's really no behavioral enrichments, which is to say that there's no way for them to express their need to perch, to nest, to dust bathe, to do other things that preference studies and aversion studies suggest are very important to hens. In a cage-free environment, there are similar total numbers of hens as there would be in a facility. So we're still talking about hundreds of thousands of hens in a, in a single farm, perhaps 50,000 in, in one barn. Uh, but within that environment, they're free to roam around. So it's typically entirely indoors, and there is both horizontal and vertical space. On the horizontal space, the minimum required by the industry standards are 144 square inches, so more than double what's required for each bird within a cage. Um, but more importantly, obviously, given they can move around, they can functionally make use of, of far more space. And, and I think critically about uh, these cage tree environments, industry standards require that there be access to perching space, to dust bathing, and to nesting boxes. And, and again, we know these are all really important things for hens. So clearly there are still things lacking from the setup. They don't have access to the outdoors. These are still high density operations. And there are still real management concerns. That mortality, for instance, can be very variable depending on the management of the operation. They're harder to manage than battery cage operations are. So there, there remain major animal welfare concerns, but I also feel pretty confident that it's a significant improvement. What about uh, free-range chickens? Are they better off again? I think in, in most ways they are. So I, I think that uh, I, I know less about this because I haven't, haven't read up as much on the studies with free-range. Free-range still remains a, a tiny fraction of the U.S. market um, and, and, is, and, and is simply not financially viable for these companies right now. That's different than in the U.K. and Australia, right? That's in right. In Australia, it seemed like most of the egg oil was free-range. That's right. So in, in the UK and in Australia, it's now a significant portion. I don't know if it's if it's the majority yet, but it's certainly a significant portion of, of egg sales. Um, I think part of that is, is just a, a lower total scale. Um, I think also that certainly British climates are better suited to free-range operations. One of the problems that US free-range operations have is the birds often end up indoors for half the year anyway. Um, the biggest problem in free-range operations is pred predation and keeping predation under control. I think where free-range operations manage to do that, they can be very high welfare. So Even positive lives. I, I think that's quite likely. I mean, I think that there are still other problems associated with the egg industry. So, for instance, even free-range uh, operations rely on chicks from commercial hatcheries where the male chicks are normally ground up alive because there's no need for them. So there are still certainly other problems with the industry, but I think if you look just at the experience of a free-range hen in a place where predation is being controlled, I think they probably are getting to express most, if not all, of the things that a hen really cares about and wants to express. Do they still cut off the half of their beaks to prevent them from pecking? This, it varies, but in, in most free-range operations, my understanding is they don't. Okay. So de-beaking um, is done in cage operations, it's done in most cage-free operations, uh, in an environment with low enough density and with enough other um, distractions. So I think in particular, this is something with free-range hens where they have access to soil and they can peck at soil, that creates enough of other distractions that they're not going to peck at, at other hens. Mm. So we've got three broad categories, cage eggs, I guess larger cage eggs, <laughs> and then uh, free range. Do you have a sense of the relative cost uh, of the eggs from each of these different 
um, you know, means of production. So right now, U.S. egg prices are at historic lows uh, due to a variety of factors. But my understanding is that in the last uh, month, and this is in August, uh, the cage average cage egg price for a dozen has been hovering around a dollar thirty or so nationally. It's incredibly incredibly low. low. Yeah. The uh for a cage free dozen we're looking more at like two dollars twenty or so for a dozen. And for free range, I think for a lot of free range labels you're looking more at like four dollars or five dollars. Okay. So So it's several multiples. Several multiples. I think in the case of um oftentimes both cage free and free range is used as a price differentiation tool mm. as well. So, it, so they're partly just picking up consumers that are willing to pay more, even if it doesn't cost that much. Exactly, exactly. And I think that my hope is uh, that that will change over time as uh, this becomes the new standard. Mm. So as it moves away from being the, the sole specialty product, mm. it makes sense for companies to not uh, price it in that way. I recall in Australia the difference between cage eggs and free range eggs was maybe that they were double, maybe double and a half uh, mm-hmm. from memory. So maybe mm-hmm. I guess if we think about cost of production, that's maybe where we're ballparking it. Yeah, that sounds right. And I think um, certainly some of the studies coming out of Europe in terms of cage free production suggest costs about twenty five percent higher than than cage production. Mm-hmm. They don't suggest costs that are twice the the price. And. So, because the cost of production isn't that much greater, has that made this a more promising campaign to go with first? Because just companies are more willing to do it, and maybe also eggs aren't as expensive as meat in the first place, so it's like just less of an overall increase in costs. Yeah, I think those are all things that have made this more tractable. Um, I think the fact too that for a lot of company, eggs are not integral to their menu. So even for a lot of fast food companies. Eggs are something that they, you know, maybe have a couple of breakfast dishes, including, but otherwise aren't using. So I think that all, all of those things together certainly made this a, a more a more tractable first goal, and will make subsequent campaigns harder. Critics of these corporate welfare campaigns uh, might say that there's a good chance that they would have done it otherwise. Uh, other people might say uh, they might not even follow through, that they're just making these pledges to get publicity and then they're not going to do it when, when push comes to shove. Uh, others might say that the welfare gain moving from these tiny cages to slightly less tiny cages is not so large. Uh, what do you say to, to people who offer crit- uh, you know, critiques of this kind? Sure. So I think those are all valid critiques, uh, and I, I also feel pretty confident that they're all wrong. Uh, so <laughs> the, uh, the the on, on the first point, whether these would have happened anyway, I think that you can you can really trace the advocacy country by country. So in the United States, until two thousand and eight, virtually no companies other than Whole Foods and a few kind of natural foods places had made any cage free pledges, and really up until two thousand and fifteen none of the major players had made 100% cage-free pledges. And you can trace through that time when the advocacy started. So when did advocates start working on this issue? And it squares up perfectly with when the companies made these pledges. So unless you kind of think that the cultural conditions changed dramatically between 2010 and 2015, it it just makes sense that uh, advocates played the role. And that's not to say it was just their corporate campaigns. I think that the political initiatives that advocates had brought, I think the undercover investigations, I think all of these were important to kind of setting the atmospherics for these campaigns. But I I think just looking at, and even to me, the even stronger evidence of this is looking at other countries. So look at Brazil or Mexico. Until 2016, I'm not aware of any cage-free pledges in either country. Uh, Now there are about 20 in both. And that has everything to do with advocates starting campaigns in those countries. Similar thing has happened in Europe, in France, in Italy, where these campaigns started in the last two years. Until then, no K tree pledges. Now, major K tree pledges. So, I think just tracing that timeline is is a pretty easy way to kind of see. Uh, particularly given that's been staged over different times in different countries. So it's not like everyone just did it in 2015. It happened whenever the advocates in that country started campaigning on the issue. In terms of the second question of whether these companies will follow through, I think that is a a very real concern, and I think it's something that we're going to need to remain focused on. I'm pretty optimistic on the cage-free pledges in the U.S. at least. So what we've seen already is that just a few years ago, uh, a tiny fraction of the U.S. egg industry was cage-free. It was was as low as about 3% a decade ago. Now we're up to 14% of the industry is already cage-free, so there are already about 45 million birds right now in the U.S. that are cage-free. 
and the trend line is very strongly up, as is the projected uh, expansion over the next few years. So what we're seeing so far suggests the egg industry is taking this very seriously, suggests that companies are taking their pledges seriously. That doesn't mean that every company is going to take it seriously, and I think there will need to be some campaigns down the line against companies that seek to back out of their pledges or seek to ignore them. There will need to be some campaigns to hold them to their pledges, but I'm optimistic that those campaigns will be successful and that we will get rid of cages within the U.S., the uh, final concern around whether cage-free is uh, significantly better for hens. We've um, been doing a report internally on on part of this, and, and I hope it will uh, it, it'll go up online soon, but particularly looking at the claim that mortality might be higher in cage-free systems. But to me, at least on the behavioral side, it seems pretty clear that cage-free systems are preferable to cages. Not only do birds have the, the simple behavioural freedom to turn and move around and flap their wings, but the preference studies, and, and these are studies where hens are given opportunities, where they're, they're, it, we find how hard will they work to do something? Will they push through a, a cage wall? Will they give up food for an opportunity? Those studies suggest very strongly that these birds have a real need to do these things they can only do in cage-free environments, like nesting, perching, dust bathing. So that doesn't tell us at all that the system is perfect or even that the birds have net positive lives or anything like that. But I think it, it should make us pretty confident that their behavioral opportunities are significantly better and that that really is a positive for welfare compared to battery cages. So we've talked about uh, clean meat and plant-based meat substitutes and I guess incidentally also genetic modification of mm -hmm. animals. Uh, are there any other technologies that would be useful to develop uh, if there's any engineers listening or mm -hmm. you know, other scientific researchers or entrepreneurs? Sure. So I, I can think of two other categories of research. One is around other animal products. So, for instance, around growing eggs or growing other animal product alternatives. And this is what Clara Foods is already doing, um, but I think there's a lot more potential on that scope. The other side, which I think often gets neglected, is around animal welfare research and improvements. So, particularly looking at technologies that could get rid of the need to do particularly brutal things to animals on factory farms. So, one example is... Piglets, male piglets right now, are castrated uh, within days of birth almost entirely because consumers don't like the taste of boar taint, it's called, the, the kind of taste that an intact boar has. And uh, as a result, there's, there's this process which we know is extremely painful. Now, there are already some basic immunocastration techniques, so there are things where these pigs instead could be injected and would completely get rid of the need to castrate them. Those haven't been adopted widely for various reasons, but simply improved technology on that front could get rid of about 40, 50 million piglets being castrated just in the US alone every year. Another example would be Inovo sexing technologies for eggs. So I think I mentioned earlier the male chicks being ground up in the egg industry. This is something that's done because there's no perceived need for these male chicks. They're ground up because there's, there's no other alternative the egg industry thinks they have. Uh, here, just having a technology where farmers can see into the egg in advance and see what gender it is, and then either prevent male uh, chicks from, either prevent male eggs from uh, developing at all, or abort them early in the process, uh, seems like a far more humane alternative there. So I think there are a number of, of animal welfare science innovations that are yet to be developed further, and where I think there's often quite low-hanging fruit and not a lot of people working in the field, such that a, an engineer or a scientist with some real skills could make some real inroads there. Why grind up all of these hundreds of millions, billions of baby chicks alive rather than kill them using, say, carbon monoxide or some other you know, painless method? So some farmers do use carbon monoxide, but the, the kind of horrible reality of, of factory farming industry is that everything is, is dictated by cost, and even a small differential in cost will be used to justify the kind of most monstrous treatment, and, and this is an example of that. I mean, it's, it is more expensive to buy carbon monoxide gas than it is to operate an electric macerator. And so they operate macerators. <laughs>
by a fraction of a cent per check. Exactly, exactly. But I mean, this is just at the scale they operate, those fractions of cents add up and, and there's, it really is just so heavily dictated by those tiny, those tiny cost differentials. I mean, for that matter, they could raise the male egg-laying hens as meat chickens and some organic and free-range producers will do that. But the vast majority of producers won't do that because their meat yield is worse than for broiler meat chickens. So they would rather just kill them and then raise an, another chicken entirely for that purpose. Have you ever met someone in the agricultural industry or the animal agriculture industry who you've explained the conditions animals are in and why this is immoral and they've just been overcome with shame and decided to leave or change their, change their ways? <laughs> Um, Have you ever heard of a story like this? Well, people so, just think, you know, maybe I'm one of the baddies and, you know, I'm, I'm going to hell or whatever sure, the like, sure. you know, religious equivalent would be. So, so I did have a friend. I, I went to a university at the University of Auckland for six months before I came over to the United States for, for university. And I had a friend from a dairy farming family. Uh, and both of his, two of his, his brothers uh, went into dairy farming and, and, uh, and, I uh, ultimately persuaded him to go vegan, and, and he's <laughs> since then uh, been, been vegan and been very concerned about factory farming. When I say I did, it was mainly that we debated and I got him to read uh, Animal Liberation, and, and <laughs> that, that had the effect. You know, what I found a lot more often with people in industry is either that they are understandably very defensive because they have a lot at stake in the current system, or that they're just not particularly happy about aspects of the system, but they feel like they already have major sunk costs and they're already sort of bought into it and that they either don't have the power to change it or that someone else will do it if they don't. And so I think this is a kind of com common refrain is that it's just, it's the market dictating this. They don't have a ton of autonomy about setting these conditions or changing how animals are treated. Mm. Yeah, I, I did know some people at, at university who uh, especially came from dairy farming mm -hmm. or uh, or had free ranging livestock, mm -hmm. and I and I got to say in those cases it is somewhat harder to persuade people mm -hmm. because oh, yeah. in fact the conditions for um, dairy cows are probably among among the least bad, mm -hmm. and also free ranging livestock mm -hmm. and that they say based on my experience they seem to have positive lives, and, mm -hmm. and it's understandable that they're, they're not ignorant about what's going on. Right. But I'm more thinking yeah people who raise broiler chickens or, right. or caged chickens. Uh, it does require an astonishing lack of empathy, I think, to, to just not think that this is a moral issue. Yeah, I think that's right. But I think that there's also an aspect of, of focusing on particular rationalization. So I had a really interesting example recently of I was talking with a member of the uh, Pew Commission on Industrial Agriculture, which was a sort of blue ribbon panel put out a number of years ago. And he's a, a quite senior professor at uh, Johns Hopkins. And he said the most shocking experience for him as a scientist was visiting a major pig factory farm at the University of Iowa that was part of the, I think it was maybe it was Iowa State rather, it was part of the university, it was kind of an agricultural demonstration facility and they were using gestation crates. And he walked in and he asked... Do you, do you want to just describe gestation crates for a second? Sure, gestation crates are uh, uh, essentially coffin-sized crates that are used for pigs during their pregnancy. So pigs typically spend their 16-week pregnancy in a gestation crate before being moved to a farrowing crate for about four weeks uh, while they give birth to their litter. Then they're re-inseminated and moved back into a gestation crate. So they spend the majority of their three- to four-year lifespan in these crates where they are completely immobilized. I mean, they can't turn around. They, they can just lie down. Uh, but that, that's about it. It really is just astonishingly evil. It really is. I think that it's, it's probably one of the, the most obviously evil practices used in factory farming. It, it just has so little justification and, and is so obviously cruel to these smart and complex creatures. And, you know, in this particular case, the this, this scientist was telling me that he asked these uh, students at Iowa State who were studying animal science or, or studying veterinary sciences, and he asked them, what did they think about this? And they all said they thought it was great. And they pointed out that these pigs didn't have to worry about climatic variation, didn't have to worry for a shortage of food, didn't have to worry about a lack of water. And so they really focused on those few aspects of the system that were providing <laughs> for the pigs' needs. And he even said, he asked one of the scientists there, he said, you know, how, how do you justify this not providing for all these pigs' needs? And she said, well, we are providing for the pig's needs. They can drink as much as they want, and they can eat as much as they want, and they can go to the bathroom whenever they want. 
I would be interested to offer this person a lifestyle that is uh, <laughs> nourishing to them by, by the same scientific standard. Indeed. <laughs> Well, that leads us uh, fairly naturally to the uh, next approach that I'd like to discuss, which is undercover investigations mm -hmm. of conditions in farms. And I guess that in the more extreme case, uh, rescues that sometimes take place after those undercover investigations. Do you want to describe what, what, what those approaches involve? Sure. So for several decades now, activists have gone undercover in factory farms to expose the conditions. And this is really a necessity because... These farms deliberately shut themselves off from the world and try and avoid consumers seeing how animals are treated. And so the most common method for these investigations involves investigators securing a job at a facility and then once they're on the job using secret cameras to simply film what's going on. And they then uh, typically will turn that film over to the authorities and at the same time publish it so that the public can become aware. And the one recent major threat to these undercover investigations has been a set of ag-gag laws passed in various states which have sought to criminalise undercover investigations to make it basically a felony to engage in these kind of employment-based undercover investigations. And a promising development on that front, about five or six states passed these ag-gag laws in recent years. Most recently, though, two different federal courts have struck down ag-gag laws in Utah and in Idaho under the First Amendment. Okay. My understanding of the First Amendment is that uh, you might still be prosecuted for stealing the information because it might be a breach of contract, a, mm -hmm. a breach of perhaps your, your labour agreement as an employee, but that having gotten the video, uh, you can't stop anyone from, mm -hmm. from publishing it because that would be a violation of their freedom mm -hmm. of expression. Mm -hmm. do, do I understand that correctly? So th these, these rulings have gone a little beyond this, and it's, okay. it's certainly, I think, it's very clearly established under the First Amendment that you have a right to publish anything. So if you already have the video, you absolutely have a right to publish that. I think the area that was a little murkier until these recent rulings was the gathering of that information with the explicit purpose of publishing it. Mm -hmm. And in this case, in both of these cases, the courts found that that was a First Amendment protected activity. Mm -hmm. That essentially that gathering of information was part of that same act of speech and that same act of, of publicizing conditions, and, and in particular, that these laws were so obviously targeted at suppressing speech. They were so obviously targeted at stopping the publication of these videos, and that they shouldn't be able to achieve their aim by just focusing on the back end <laughs> rather than explicitly banning that, uh, the, that publication. Well, I, I love the First Amendment even more now. <laughs> I guess... My understanding is it was always so clear that it was going to violate the First Amendment in some form that uh, these it was kind of vexatious leg legislation, just an attempt to hassle animal activists and force them to go into court to defend themselves. Yeah, that's certainly one, one interpretation. I don't think that's how the animal agriculture industry found it. I th saw it. I mean, they certainly were trying to hassle activists and, and trying to take them into court. But I think that, that they believed they could do this uh, and I, I think perhaps they just don't have a, a great deal of respect for the first amendment uh, so i think what's been what's been really great to see has been this becoming such a prominent free speech issue the aclu getting involved other major free speech advocates getting involved mm -hmm. and really as a result these judges seeing this so clearly for what it is as an attempt to suppress speech yeah i'm a, I'm a monthly donor to the aclu so nice. I guess I'll, uh, I'll, I'll keep going with that <laughs> Let's, uh, let, let's step back again. So they, they do these undercover investigations. Mm -hmm. uh, is it difficult to slip people in uh, who, I guess, if you have any association with the animal welfare movement, of course, you're not going to be hired for a factory farm, I expect. That's correct. So it, it is, it's tough to do undercover investigations. And particularly now, the, the kind of sad response of, of factory farms to these investigations has been, first, to try to criminalise them, and secondly, to try and prevent investigators getting in in the first place. So rather than looking at changing the conditions or getting rid of things that might look terrible, they've really focused on how they could increase their vetting of applicants. The, I think the reason why investigators still get in is that being a factory farm worker or a slaughterhouse worker is not a very sought-after profession. And so typically these farms and these slaughterhouses are still pretty desperate to hire workers. And they're not asking many questions. In many cases, they're getting undocumented immigrants or others, and they, so they have reasons to not ask questions. Makes sense. So then groups that do this, like uh, Mercy for Animals and Animal Equality, that, that's correct? They're two of the they, prime groups, yep. They then put out 
these videos mm -hmm. uh, after some editing, I guess. Do you think that when they edit them, they it's like a faithful representation of all of the footage, or do they de do they deliberately you know pull out the the worst abuses? So I mean, I think there's certainly an aspect of of course you're going to focus on on some of the more horrific things you need that you see, but but I do think it's accurate, and I think um, two two kind of data points on this. One was a few months ago I was visiting factory farms in India. And the battery cages there look exactly as they do on the videos. And, and so many of the abuses that you see on these videos, in my eyes, all the worst abuses, like gestation crates or battery cages, they're not aberrations. They're, they're part of the design of the facility. So it's not a case that they just once caught this cage on camera. The cage isn't moving. <laughs> so I always sort of find it funny when, when industry says, oh, these are just a few bad apples. It's, but then at the same time, industry publishes statistics saying, well, 90% of our facilities use these cages. Or they publish an instruction manual. Right, or they publish an exactly instruction manual on exactly how to use them. So, so yeah, I think that uh, that part certainly uh, seems representative. The other thing I would say is, is having been involved at the Humane Society, I watched the full outtakes of one of the an investigation at a calf slaughterhouse. And I did this to identify legal violations that we could... Um, point out to the USDA and having watched that I can tell you that the worst things were not included in the video that it was it because was it would be too it was too to graphic even. it was too graphic and so I mean for the media to agree to cover things you can't show things that are too graphic and so a lot of the really the what I considered the worst stuff was just never shown was never put online was never put anywhere it w would violate the YouTube you know content policies that wouldn't it wouldn't be allowed up on Facebook so as much as and, it is, the, and that's what the viewers are effectively paying people to do, right? <laughs> so the um, yeah, to me, I mean, that's that's the thing is like you're sort of seeing, you, yes, you're seeing some of the the more unusual things. So certainly, and, and unfortunately, what's newsworthy is often what's unusual or weird. So the fact that these gestation crates are being used day in day out and are absolutely awful is not newsworthy. But when some workers in Ohio strung up a pig behind a forklift, it was newsworthy. Now, I have no doubt that's an isolated incident, but it's also in many ways representative of the culture that operates within these facilities. Maybe you could contrive other unusual things that they could do on camera, like, I don't know, put party hats on the pigs. Just, like, <laughs> just something silly to get the media's attention because that would be novel. And in the meantime, people would see what the conditions in the farm are. I, I, I like that idea. I hope that uh, putting party hats on pigs is, is the worst that we find in these videos in the future. So, I guess, okay, th so then they release the videos. Mm hmm um, what is the goal here? Is it to get people to become vegetarian? Is it to get policy reform? Is it just to get a lot of media for, for the charity and attract donations? I think there are multiple goals, and it certainly varies by the group that's involved. But I do see the overarching goal is to make people aware of the cruelty on these farms and aware of the conditions they're subsidizing when they buy animal products. So people will have different responses to that. Some people certainly will see that and say they want nothing to do with it and they're going to go vegetarian or vegan or dramatically reduce the amount of animal products they buy. Some people will see that and think we need wholesale political or corporate reforms and will really get involved in activism and, and see this as a motivation to get involved in activism. So I think it's really just that awareness is, is, a, motiv is a heavily motivating factor for people and, and the transparency is so important. And it's, it's less prescriptive of what will come after that and more just that that is the essential first step for most of the important actions on this issue. Do they then uh, uh, prosecute? Uh, I guess it sounded like at HSUS, that's one thing that you were doing, is looking at these videos and then trying to prosecute. So you're saying it's hard to get standing. That's right, yeah. So we wouldn't have the prosecution power, but we would go to prosecutors. So in every case that I'm aware of, undercover investigators go to prosecutors, the local prosecutors that have jurisdiction over this, and present them the evidence. Now, the biggest problem they face is that most of the forms of cruelty they find on camera are completely legal. So, for instance, the use of gestation crates, completely legal, except in a couple of states, uh, even though it's a form of animal cruelty, that would be a felony if done to a dog or a cat. But the way the laws are written, it's completely legal to do it to, to farm animals. In fact, there's a particularly, um, a particularly kind of mean twist to a lot of states' animal cruelty laws where anything that is defined as a common agricultural practice is exempt from the animal cruelty law. So the more people do it, uh, the less illegal it becomes. Exactly. And, and so, I mean, one, one just crazy uh, incarnation of this, I recommend people who are looking to, to watch something on this. There was an HBO documentary 
several years back called Death on a Factory Farm. And this documentary was about the case I mentioned of Ohio farmers using forklifts to, uh, to strangle pigs. And the local prosecutors, local prosecutors normally do, do nothing about these things, particularly because they're in factory farming areas. But in this case, they were appalled at what they saw and they said, yeah, we'll bring an animal cruelty prosecution. This is obviously not a common agricultural practice. And the defense of the pig farmer was, this is a common agricultural practice. And amazingly, the state pork association sent not just their president, but also veterinarians to go and say that this was a common agricultural practice. And the judge ultimately found it was, because the pork industry said it was, and who's in a better position to know what's a common agricultural practice than the pork industry? Was that ever turned against them in, in, in any subsequent campaigns? Well, it, certainly in this, uh, in this documentary, <laughs> Death on a Factory Farm, I think that uh, hopefully that had an effect on people. But I think, you know, what's been unfortunate is that these issues so often just slip under the radar. People, I think, you know, the vast majority of Americans have no idea that state animal cruelty laws don't apply to the vast majority of farm animals and farm practices. In fact, we know that from polls, that when people find out that most agricultural practices are exempt from animal cruelty laws, they think that's obviously wrong. But it's just not something they're paying much attention to. What about in Europe? Uh, mm-hmm. I know Mercy for Animals and Animal Equality are both pretty big players there. Uh, do they ever prosecute there? or Can they ever bring suits themselves? So animal equality is actually the, the, the bigger player in Europe, but there are a number of others like Compassion World Farming. I'm not sure about their ability to prosecute or, or to bring legal mechanisms. I, I, so, so, so these are mostly public advocacy media approaches. That's right. That's right. So there have definitely been some exceptions. So I know, for instance, in Germany, there's been some public litigation, um, some of which I think has even reached the German Constitutional Court. Um, about these issues. In Israel, there's been some really powerful litigation. Foie gras was banned in Israel based on litigation. Um, so, so there has been some of that. My understanding is that for the most part in Europe, we're still talking about similar methods, though, in terms of undercover investigations, corporate campaigns, plus with the added benefit that there is a somewhat functioning political system at the EU level that is able, to, is able to enact directives of the sort that the US political system is unable or unwilling to do. Do you want to comment on the kind of public response you see when one of these undercover investigations is made public? Yeah, I mean, I think that almost uh, universally people are outraged. I, I think that it's, uh, it's, it's heartening in the sense that... Uh, you generally see just in terms of, of the responses people leave on Facebook or the way that news articles are perceived or when these are shown to people on the street that people are pretty outraged. I think what can be frustrating for advocates is that that doesn't necessarily lead people to make changes in their own diets or in, in their actions. Um, but my hope is that over time, these are really building the, the basis for larger reforms. And I think that's part of what you're seeing in the corporate reforms. I mean, I think one reason these were able to take off so quickly was that for over a decade, undercover investigators had been exposing conditions in battery cages and started to sensitize the public to how horrific these conditions were. I think that's what created a lot of the the kind of ground that was fertile for those campaigns. Do you want to talk about the cost effectiveness of the undercover investigations? My understanding is that they're really quite cheap to run and that they get a a huge amount of of media views uh, for, you know, each dollar spent. Yeah, I think that's right. So I think generally these investigations cost somewhere between fifty and $100,000, and, and that's kind of from start to finish, including the legal advice, the rolling it out, the PR and everything, which is, is pretty cheap when, when some of these get a lot of publicity. The primary constraint right now on investigations is not financial. So most of the groups that do them, at least in the US and, and I think also in Europe, have the funding to do so. But what they found is that there's a risk of saturating the market. So, for instance, Mercy for Animals uh, actually cut back on the number of investigations that it did each year because it found that reporters became less and less interested in them the more it put out. Um, so, unfortunately, it's, sort of, it's, it's a tactic that has natural limits to it. But, you know, one way we're, we're getting around those limits is by supporting undercover investigations in other countries where there have been fewer. And so, for instance, Mercy for Animals just did a major investigation in Brazil where there hadn't been a lot of investigations previously. And there are other investigations coming out from animal equality in, in Mexico and Germany. And so I think there's still a lot more potential to scale this globally. Mm. It's possible that someone listening to this might be in a position to, to help with an undercover investigation and not doesn't yet have an association with uh, animal charity. Mm. 
Uh, if so, I would suggest do not go posting on Facebook. Uh, <laughs> uh, this this issue uh, keep your keep your views under under wraps. Um, and I guess very privately contact uh, Mercy for Animals or one of the other groups that does undercover investigations? I think that's right. I think that if someone is interested in becoming an undercover investigator, they would do well to contact Mercy for Animals or Animal Equality or even the Humane Society of the United States. Mm -hmm. I think that those groups are always looking for investigators, and as you say, it needs to be someone who hasn't posted anything online about uh, farm animals. And it also needs to be someone who is really resilient, who's, who's able to work in an environment where you're witnessing really horrific abuses of animals on a daily basis and can keep, keep a straight face. Keep a straight face, exactly. Not, not really give any indication or any, any hint of things being wrong. So I think, it's, I think it's a very tough, demanding task and I have immense respect for the people who, who succeed in doing it. And one thing I would note for people who might be interested is that it doesn't need to be a lifelong career. I know a number of people who have, who have done it for six months and that's as long as they could last, but that was long enough to investigate two different facilities and really to make a major, major impact by doing that. Likewise, I have uh, really immense respect for people who have the grit to, to go through this with something like that. I think mm -hmm. I, I might struggle myself. Are these undercover investigations something that you fund very much at Open Film? So we've, we've started funding particularly on the international side uh, where we see the potential to scale up undercover investigations more. So it's certainly, it's been a portion of our grants already in Latin America and in India, and we're looking at the potential for more funding of investigations in Europe. As we move more and more toward general support for groups we trust, it's really going to be in their discretion whether these funds they, they use for that purpose. But, but certainly it's something, it's, it's an intervention that I, that I view as potentially very cost effective. Hmm. Let's move on then to meat substitute research of, of various kinds. I've done an interview with Bruce Friedrich, who uh, heads up the Good Food Institute, one of the groups that you fund in this area, possibly the only group that you fund in this area at this Ye point. Yes, that's right. Uh, so that was about an hour and a half, and it goes through uh, a lot of a lot of basics. So, so we might go a bit quickly through this mm -hmm. one. But what, what's your perspective on on meat substitute research? I think there is is huge long term potential to transition from an animal product based economy to an economy based around either plant based or cellular agriculture alternatives to animal products. And, and I do think that that is one of the more promising and exciting long term solutions to really getting rid of, of farm animal suffering. I think that right now, the technology is far more advanced on the plant-based side. And so you're seeing already, for instance, products like Beyond Meat or Impossible Foods um, producing things that many people find to be kind of equivalent to meat and, and to have a similar, similar proposition. And I think that's only going to keep getting better. I think that on the cellular agricultural side, the growing of meat, we're, we're not as far along and there's a need for a lot more research, but obviously there is that potential down the line for it to be something transformative. Yeah, my, my view, I think, is if I could have you know, one very skilled person working on any individual thing uh, that, to try to improve human, uh, sorry, uh, to improve animal welfare, um, my guess is that having a really fantastic food scientist working on plant-based meat substitutes mm -hmm. or, um, or clean meat um, as it's uh, as it's uh, now called, is uh, probably among the most effective careers. That's a, that's a little bit of a speculative guess, mm -hmm. but I think uh, not a not a totally uninformed one. Now, on the podcast with uh, Bruce that I'll, that I'll put up a link to in the in the show notes, uh, he kind of made the case for uh, doing this kind of research and mm -hmm. why it's extremely cost effective. Uh, do you want to maybe offer some counterpoints? What what are your biggest reservations? Well, I, I think this research is likely to be <laughs> cost effective, and I certainly think that from a talent perspective, hmm. to any listener who has a science scientific background or a scientific aptitude, I would strongly encourage them to, to consider this. Because, uh, and it's more of a talent gap than a funding gap, because in as much as there are good projects, then there's often a quite a lot of commercial interest in this already. Is that right? Exactly. So I think that there's, there's a lot of funding already on the private side, the for-profit side. I think we could certainly use more funding. I mean, the, the more the merrier on this issue. But there, there has been, if you look, for instance, at Impossible Foods, its last funding round was $75 million. This one before that was over $100 million. Uh, if you look at companies like Hampton Creek, on over $100 million. So there are a number of these pretty major startups with a lot of, a lot of funding. 
And so is it the case that maybe a, a really good food scientist could be worth, you know, a million dollars in donations a year or possibly even more in terms of uh, like how much money you need to do a certain amount of good is what an extra person can do? Yeah, I think they could easily be worth a million dollars. I think they could well be worth more than that. I mean, when you look at the, the impact that someone like Pat Brown at Impossible Foods or Ethan Brown at uh, Beyond Meat, no relation, have uh, have had in this space... I think that that one person really can make a huge difference on that. Another example is Uma Valetti at, at Memphis Meats. Uh, so I think that just having a few really strong scientists advancing this field, testing new approaches, uh, that that is the real need that we have now. Sorry, so I, I interrupted you. I think you were going to go into perhaps some of your reservations about the, the area. Well, I, I think probably not so much reservations as as solely reasons why we have so far focused elsewhere. So I would say that uh, I think this is, again, from a talent perspective, something great to do, but also from a private funding perspective, something great to do. It's only when I look at at our potential uh, to spend charitable dollars on the foundation side that it becomes less obvious that we should focus heavily on the alternatives. And the biggest reason for this is because the charitable side is just so much more neglected than the for-profit side where this where a lot of this research is being done so and the other thing is that i haven't seen the same degree of charitable opportunities outside of the good food institute mm-hmm. so the good food institute we're already supporting and they're doing some great stuff uh, but when you look at at for instance academic institutions and what they're doing in the space i haven't yet seen those opportunities they may come along. When they do, they'll probably be quite expensive because science is expensive. But they could still well be worth doing. They could well be worth the, the kind of cost effectiveness, past cost effectiveness test. Um, so I, I don't have reservations against this field. I just think so far, you know, we've mainly supported it from the for profit side. We made an investment in possible foods. Um, and we'll, we'll continue looking for potential to do more on the charitable side. Your colleague, Nick Beckstead, published a blog post two years ago where he expressed uh, some skepticism about the scientific um, practicality of clean meat. Uh, Do you want to comment on that, or should I just bring that up with Nick when I speak to him uh, tomorrow? (laughs) Probably best to bring that up with Nick. He's, He's the expert there. Okay. All right, moving on to the next approach, there's groups that are doing research, both social science research um, and, I guess, uh, you know, cause prioritization research, uh, like animal charity evaluators or, you know, also charity evaluation similar Mm -hmm. to, to, to what you do. Uh, trying to figure out how we can best help animals. Uh, I think you've given a grant to animal charity evaluators. Is that right? That's right, yeah. Are there any other researchers that you've given money to, perhaps in academia? So we've, we've also given some funding, um, as I mentioned, to the Animal Welfare Action uh, Lab, which is for replication of this, of this study on, on MTIP. Uh, we've supported a number of research initiatives focused specifically on animal welfare. So, for instance, we're supporting a Dutch researcher to come up with a comprehensive evaluation of different potential chicken welfare reforms and their impact on the welfare of broiler chickens. Uh, in the space of evaluating advocacy techniques, uh, our, own, our, our only things have been that, that MTurk study and now uh, support of animal charity evaluators. But we're certainly open to supporting more research there. I think it's a really important priority. One reason we haven't funded it more to date is that animal charity evaluators has their own research fund. Uh, and that has, has really taken some of the best projects in, in the space. I would love to see more projects and I, I definitely remain open to funding more in that space. Do you think that funding research is more or you know less cost effective than some of the other things that you fund? Do, do you have any cost effectiveness estimates, even ballpark ones? Yeah, I don't have great cost effectiveness estimates on, on the research piece. I mean, I think part of the problem is that there's been so little really rigorous research to date that it's it's hard to say based on that how, how effective it's been. I do think that research that has the potential to change how large organizations are allocating their funds is potentially very impactful. So, for instance, research working out if online ads are effective in their goals or not uh, is very important because that's something that still groups are spending a lot of money on. And obviously, if it's not effective, it would be better that they reallocate that funding towards something that is. Yeah. So... Full disclosure, I was on the board of Animal Charity Evaluators for its first uh, two and a half years of life. So mm-hmm. maybe I'll, I'll explain some of, some of the reservations I have mm-hmm. about uh, do, doing research in general. Yeah. Um, what, one of the concerns I had uh, when I was on the board was that 
as you said earlier, the animal space just in general is really quite small. We're talking only about mm-hmm. tens of millions of dollars. Mm-hmm. And when the amount of funding that you can influence is is small, that potentially means that you only want to be spending a small amount of money kind of figuring out how to allocate that or mm-hmm. doing or doing research that can provide a multiplier on that. Um, and, you know, even... Even among those tens of millions, there's only so many donors who are responsive to the kind of evidence that, that ACE or other similar groups like, like you might, might be collecting. Uh, so that was one possible reason that it, that it wouldn't be that effective. On the other hand, uh, it could be the case that if you can produce proper research, then maybe a lot more people will jump into the field. Uh, so so that, that would be a hopeful thing. Another is uh, it seemed like in animal charity you faced... Uh, there's a general problem with research that you tend to look for the keys under the lamppost and that can um, lead people in, uh, into the wrong direction. And it seems like that happened a little bit early on with the studies on leafleting that were difficult to study but easier to study than, than other things and uh, were promoted a lot and now probably seem less cost-effective than, than many other approaches that, that could be taken. And I, I guess there's, there's always a concern that uh, unless you have people who are willing to venture out into really difficult-to-study areas mm-hmm. and give them fair treatment, that you could end up really distorting where the money's going. Uh, do you have any responses to that? I, I really agree with everything you just said. I mean, I think that um, it's certainly the case that there needs to be the, the primary focus should be on doing things and activism and, and only then does it make sense to have research to be testing that. You don't want to just be in a constant testing phase. Mm-hmm. I do think that now that Open Philanthropy Project is in the space and a number of other major donors have come online, there is more value to that research. I mean, obviously it would affect our decisions. I think it would also affect a number of other major donors and a number of, of major groups. So I do think there's a value to, to more um, evidence. I also think a lot of the things are, are hard to test and, and you know that has kind of biased people toward, as you were saying, interventions that are relatively easier to evaluate, like like leafleting. So I do think it's it's a tough assignment, um, and we should certainly avoid the bias toward the easily measurable. But I still think it's it's worth doing where we can produce rigorous studies that can even just demonstrate whether an approach has some effect or, or doesn't. Mm. I should say that uh, the amount of money moved per dollar spent for ACE, so that that ratio has actually been been going up over time. Mm-hmm. So it's uh, not the case that there are, um, you know, the amount of research that they're doing is out of whack with the amount of uh, money that they're influencing. Uh, and and, and that, that's, that, that, that situation is not getting worse as they grow. Yeah, and I'm pretty optimistic that there will be more and more funding in this space. I mean, I think as, as EAs, but also all sorts of other donors are waking up to the importance of farm animal welfare and the potential tractability and, and the current neglectedness, I think that will draw more funders into the space and, and that will make research more important. All right, so I think we've been through most of the main categories of work that you fund. Are there any others that I've missed? I think those are uh, the main ones. I mean, we've, as I kind of alluded to, we've funded some animal welfare research. So we funded both a uh, Dutch study. We've also co-funded a study with a government institution focused half on finding alternatives to castration in piglets to get rid of the need for castration and half on optimizing welfare in cage tree environments so that hens do have better welfare in cage tree environments. Um, we've also made a number of smaller, uh, sort of more speculative grants. So one example is we recently made a $500,000 grant to the Greenfield Project, which is uh, two very talented advocates who have started a new group focused on non-controversial regulatory reform approaches. So looking for where there are kind of small s- policy wins that could be brought about that aren't likely to engender a lot of opposition. So for instance, gaining more funding for animal welfare research. Um, so it'll be interesting to, to see whether that is a viable approach or not. It's a case of getting smaller wins with greater likelihood. Yeah, and, and, and also just... Uh, really testing an approach that hasn't been tested previously. I mean, all the sort of regulatory and policy work that's been done to date has focused firstly on on the big button issues that tend to be controversial, but it's also been done by groups, by animal rights groups, who are inherently controversial in the in the political space. So just seeing whether having a different messenger and, and having a different message can can make a can make a difference there is really the objective. 
Uh, do you fund Compassion and World Farming? Just we do. You do? Oh, okay. Right, right. I uh, did just maybe want to brief, briefly say what they do. Sure. Yeah, so we fund them both in the US and in the UK and actually in China, for that matter. Um, so they're uh, one of the largest groups focused solely on farm animal welfare. They do take a variety of approaches. So in the US, they're primarily, primarily involved in corporate campaigning and, and corporate outreach. In the UK, they do some corporate outreach. They also do a lot of work at the European Union level. Yeah. And they have a pretty significant scientific department and, um, and, and try and do kind of a lot of thought leadership or, or finding the right answers. Mm-hmm. Um, so we funded them actually in, in the UK on fish welfare mm-hmm. and, and looking into new approaches there. And then in China, they have a food business program where they're working with Chinese businesses uh, basically giving them awards for incremental improvements in, in the conditions of their animals. Okay, what is the best argument against working on animal welfare with your career, in your view? I think it depends a lot on someone's personal comparative advantage and also, obviously, on what motivates them. So if, if someone is, uh, you know, has, has a background in researching vaccines, then maybe you should work on vaccine research. Or if, if someone is really motivated to work in, in developing nations directly with people in extreme poverty, then that's probably where you're going to be most effective. So I would say that the strongest arguments are just going to come down to individual circumstances around motivation and, and around qualifications. Mm. And I, I could think of plenty of people for whom this is not the right career path, but I also think for, for a lot of people, hopefully it will be. Mm. What do you say to those who say that we should focus on on humans, uh, humans who are suffering a great deal? Uh, do Do you think that is it a reasonable disagreement that people can have uh, whether you know animals are conscious and how much they matter morally, or do you think that that's actually that's uh, settled well enough to say that no, this is an important problem? Yeah, I think that it's pretty settled that that most animals are conscious. I mean, at, at the very least, mammals and birds. And I think that there is increasingly a consensus that fish are conscious, too. I think that uh, it's certainly reasonable for people to think they could have a greater impact on human well-being. But I, I'm not sure it's reasonable to completely discount animal animal well-being. Um, and and I, the other thing I would just say is that I think that typically focusing on animal well-being does not come at the expense of human well-being. And something I like about the effective altruism movement is that it recognizes that we can do more than one thing and that there is value to having kind of worldview diversification and to having uh, to be working on multiple problems at the same time. Perhaps the, the biggest focus area for open philanthropy is working on things that can benefit the long-run future, mm-hmm. and so uh, future generations, in particular reducing the risk of global catastrophes. Uh, how do you think that compares in terms of effectiveness with uh, improving animal welfare? Yeah, so I don't have a, a sort of good sense of the comparison there, mainly because I don't have a good sense of, of the risks and the tractability of, of long-term interventions. Mm-hmm. The only thing I would say is that I think that animal welfare is in many ways a long-term issue. I mean, first, because factory farming certainly could remain a major threat to animals for the long run if we don't do something about it now. So there could be huge numbers of animals that suffer well into the future. But the other issue that I think people are increasingly becoming concerned about is the well-being of wild animals. And even if there's nothing we can do to improve their well-being today, I think it is very likely that in the future there will be something we can do. And so certainly that's an argument to care about human uh, civilization being in a good position in the future. But it's also a reason to really think hard about how we can make sure that the future trajectory of humans is inclined to focus on the well-being of those animals rather than to ignore it. All right. So assuming that someone was going to focus on on animal welfare, uh, what are the strongest critiques of Open Phil's uh, approach to doing so? So I'd say the first uh, critique is that we've focused too heavily on corporate campaigns and incremental animal welfare reforms. I think that this can come both from the perspective that we should be promoting complete dietary change and that animal welfare reforms are necessarily far smaller and, and, and are really kind of more tinkering with the system. And I think there's also a critique in there that we're not thinking about long-term social change, that we're really kind of thinking too much about the immediate and the present. I think another critique would be that we focus too much on opportunities that already exist and not enough on creating new opportunities. So, for instance, in relation to China, 
sort of, you know, where I said that we're, we're funding everything we could find, but we're not funding things we couldn't find. We're not funding <laughs> new initiatives in, in China. That, and, and so I think certainly, particularly if we had more time resources, it, it could make a lot of sense for us to be doing that and thinking more, far, far more proactively about what are the things that don't exist in the movement that could and, and how could we make those happen. I know that another critique some people have is that we're not doing anything on uh, clean meat and, and growing meat. And, and certainly, given it's, it's totally possible that the way that animal farm animal suffering will ultimately end is through the invention of cost-effective clean meat, uh, there is an argument that that's all we should be focused on, that we should just be spending money on that. And so I think that's a very uh, valid critique too. So these are just critiques that you keep in mind all the time and wherever you find an opportunity to, to address them without you know, raising other more severe concerns and you do that. Yeah, I think these are things that, that make sense to keep in mind. And, and you know, I could probably list off about 10 other critiques. I mean, I think there are a number of very valid critiques of what we're doing. And I, I mean, I think that's sort of inherent. There should be. I mean, there should be, we should be doing things that have enough risk associated with them and that aren't completely obvious, and and there should be a vibrant debate about it. It is good that people question that and and point out where we have biases and our worldviews and where we're missing things. And I think it's certainly our duty to keep reflecting on those criticisms and to see how we can update based on them and how we can change based on them where where it makes sense to do so. You gave uh, one of the main reasons for focusing on animals being just the sheer number of animals that there are. But uh, there's actually even more wild animals than mm. there are uh, animals in farms. And that's something that's even more seriously neglected in the sense that there's basically no organization, so that's one organization in the world that's focused on helping, uh, figuring out how we could help wild animals. Uh, so why not make that a, that a focus area? Yeah, I think there's a really strong case for that being a focus area. I mean, I think um, right now, farm animal welfare seems significantly more tractable mm. than wild animal welfare seems. But that's certainly not to say that no one should be working on it. I think it would make a lot of sense for, and as people are thinking about a career they could they could do in animal welfare and where they could kind of have the greatest marginal impact, it is a far more neglected space now, wild animal welfare. And my suspicion is that the initial research there, the initial work done in that space, will be disproportionately important. So I certainly hope there will be more work in that space. I think it's completely possible we'll fund in that space in future. Um, part of the reason we haven't to date is just that because there are so few opportunities, a sort of time to money ratio, it's, it's made more sense to focus on grant ready opportunities. But I think it's, it's quite possible we'll look at that space in future. And I, I certainly think that people listening should, should be thinking about the well-being of wild animals. One of the animals that are most numerous in the world are fish, which uh, you discussed earlier. Um, tell me, like, what, do, what do you think about fish in particular? That's, that's one that animal organizations don't tend to focus on so much, perhaps because it's harder to arouse c- compassion for them. But uh, we're, we're pretty confident that fish feel pain, is that right? I think that's right. I think that certainly there are still one or two scientists who, who object to that view, but the scientific consensus very much seems to be that, that fish do feel pain and, and do uh, have morally relevant experiences. They have very small brains, right? Uh, surprisingly small, even smaller than birds. So, uh, yeah, I'm not sure about the total brain size. I know that their brain is uh, ordered in a different way from a million brains. And, and, and the one argument made previously against fish pain was that they basically don't have a neocortex where we process pain in mammals. Uh, more recent studies have suggested that, as in birds, analogous portions of the brain can perform analogous functions. Yeah. The, so, so they don't have a neocortex, they just have just another thing that acts like the neocortex. Exactly, exactly. So I think that um, that's really where the, where the, the debate on, on pain and consciousness has been heading. It's been recognizing that evolutionarily this makes sense for them to have pain. Behaviorally, it seems like they have pain. And once we start to look into the brain functions, we see analogous uh, portions of the brain. But um, I, I think you're certainly right. This has been heavily neglected by the animal welfare movement for a long time. I think that is primarily because it's very hard to relate to something that lives underwater, is covered with scales rather than, than skin, and has beady little eyes. Uh, so I, I think that fish have really been very unlucky about their kind of natural appearance. The, um, we, we still don't know a lot about the animal welfare issues in fish farming, but I think we know enough to be very concerned. So, for instance... We know that 
the stocking densities in a lot of fish farms uh, seem very detrimental to the fish and they behave in ways that seem abnormal and seem aversive. We know that a lot of fish suffer pretty severe health problems, that on salmon farms, for instance, they have major issues with sea lice biting away at them. Um, and I think the most obvious issue of all is fish slaughter. So I was, when I was traveling in India, we visited a number of fish farms. And by far the most appalling thing I saw was the, what they call the harvesting at the fish farm. And this wasn't unique to India. This, I think, is very standard uh, on fish farms where really the, the technique is just to haul them out of the water and to leave the fish to slowly suffocate, slowly flap to death, be, crowd, be crushed to death. And this can take hours. So, I mean, we're not talking normally with mammalian slaughter. Anything that takes more than a few seconds is rightly considered inhumane. But in this case, we were talking minutes and, and, and often hours with no attempt at stunning and, and no attempt at shortening that uh, suffering. I've heard some people suggest that uh, the conditions in fish farms could even be worse than the gestation crates that we were talking about earlier. Are they just absolutely bumper to bumper in these fish farms? I think it depends a lot on the fish farm. So honestly, the, the fish farm we visited in India wasn't that crowded. The uh, and, I, and I think part of that had to do with the the system, it was farming carp, which are the most commonly farmed species globally, and they were not being fed a great deal of additional feed. So it was it was a lot of it was they were trying to grow plant matter in, in this pond that the fish would eat, which meant that they couldn't stock it that densely. Um, I've also seen pictures and videos of some fish farms that are incredibly closely stocked, and particularly those where they're using concrete tanks or using other more more high density methods. So I think there's huge variation uh, between different farming methods and between species, and, and we still need to do a lot more a lot more work on that. But I think it's certainly possible that that some portion of fish really have it the worst of all. Mm. You mentioned earlier uh, that there ha wasn't very much research done on these kind of animal welfare questions at all. Uh, there's a book that came out some time ago called Compassion by the Pound, mm. which has this uh, table that's done the rounds where they try to actually put numerical estimates on how good and bad the conditions are in various different mm. situations, yeah. like you know, uh, feedlot cattle versus... Um, uh, free-ranging cattle, uh, and they even try to compare it uh, across species. Uh, maybe not not taking into account the philosophical issues mm. or the relative consciousness of different species, but uh, just saying, you know, for, for that for that animal, how how unpleasant is it? How anxiety-inducing is it? Um, I'd be really interested to get some estimates from you. Mm. Uh, perhaps later on, we could put it up in the blog post attached yeah. to. Um, uh, to, to the podcast, but I wouldn't want to force you to try to come up with some numbers now <laughs> across the board because that would be very difficult. But mm -hmm. uh, uh, hopefully, we'll, we'll put that together and, and we could stick it in the in the post. Sure, yeah, that sounds good. And and I certainly recommend Compassion by the Pound. I think it's a great book, and and uh, it's it's shockingly independent and objective, coming from two Oklahoma agricultural economists. Mm -hmm. But uh, I do think that the way their table was originally drawn up is pretty arbitrary, I think. And I think they would probably acknowledge that, that this was really just their best guesses. There wasn't an attempt to break down the aspects of, of the animal's life. And there's a there's a necessary um, arbitrary factor. So, you know, if, if, if I draw up these numbers, they're probably still, people will reasonably disagree with them. Mm. But uh, I do think it's helpful, certainly, to think about what the experiences of these different animals is like. Mm. Well, I'll put up a link to that table cool. and see, see, if, see if you can put together your, your, your own personal views on that. Sounds good. So talked about fish, uh, let's let's move further into the weird territory. Uh, what about, say, lobsters? Is that mm. a thing that's... I mean, it's one of the things that's most shocking to me is seeing people uh, burning alive mm. uh, or boiling an animal alive. Yeah. Um, have you thought about crustaceans or prawns or anything like that? Yeah, we've, we've thought a little bit about it. I, I've had the same... always had the same reaction as you do, that it's, it's kind of shocking to me not only that we boil lobsters alive, but that it's... It, it, we, we don't even outsource it to slaughterhouses. I mean, with most of our... People almost relish it as yeah. something that's interesting and fascinating and macabre. Yeah, it is really it is really weird and, and disturbing. Um, I think, in, in, in fairness, the debate on the consciousness of lobsters and, and crabs is far less settled than it is on fish. Um, but, but I certainly don't think we should be running the risks that we are, even if even if you think it's only a 50% chance, say, that they're conscious. I think in, in some places they also stun them pretty seriously uh, at, at, the, at the spine level, uh, and so some people think that they're not conscious at that point, at least for some period of time. Yeah, and I think, I think unfortunately, it's still pretty rare. <laughs> I okay. think that, uh, you know, there's, there, is, there is one uh, device globally 
for the purpose of stunning lobsters and crabs. And, and they're uh, not doing a sufficient business. To yeah, come exactly. Over the lobsters. They're not. They're not really doing doing enough business. So the um, I think it is still overwhelmingly the case that these animals are either boiled alive or in industrial plants that they're slowly crushed or have their shells pulled off or otherwise treated in pretty horrific ways. Um, I would I would love to do more on that. I mean, it's uh, it, it is part of it is a small part of the focus of one of our fish welfare grants and the uh the challenge of course is is as intractable as fish theme crustaceans seem even more so but i do think that it makes sense to be thinking a lot about what else we could do along those lines because i i completely agree with you that the slaughter methods in particular for crustaceans are just appalling Mm. Okay, and then at the outer limits, I guess, until we hit, I don't know, artificial intelligence, uh, we we have insects, Mm. which are perhaps the the least likely to be conscious, I expect, I suppose. We could Mm. talk about bacteria or Mm -hmm. dust mites or something like that, but uh, sticking to things that people Mm -hmm. can have a real conversation Mm about. um, Yeah. We have uh, you know uh, reasonably large insects, uh, which are extremely numerous. Just mm-hmm. it's it's hard to fathom the yeah. numbers. I'll uh, I'll look them up later and, and stick them in the in the show notes. But there's far far more insects than there are mm-hmm. uh, all other animals combined. Yeah. Um. But we're much less confident that mm-hmm. they're conscious. Yeah. Uh, what do you think? Yeah. I mean, I think it, it is certainly most likely that insects are not conscious, and I very much hope that insects are not <laughs> conscious. Yeah. But that said. Uh, I would be hard-pressed to assign less than a 10% probability to it. And I do think that even at that level of probability, you should be very concerned. And certainly, I think there are things we can do, for instance, in opposing the large push now toward insect factory farming and the creation of a whole new insect protein industry. Um, Whether it makes sense for people to be focused on this entirely, I don't know. I mean, you, you sort of have to factor in, again, tractability concerns. And also for people, whether they want to work on something where they can kind of be sure that the animal is conscious and there are benefits versus somewhere where it's a lot more speculative. Hmm. Let, let me put push back on that for a minute. So there's some people who think that it's pretty clear that insects in the wild have negative lives. Hmm. And the basic argument runs that... Um, most insects basically produce incredibly large numbers of young, a tiny fraction of which survive to adulthood, mm-hmm. uh, and then they basically all die during winter. I mean, that's not, that's not the pattern of all species, but among the most numerous species, you have very, like, very quick die-offs mm-hmm. uh, in, uh, with the seasonality. So their thinking is uh, the, the likely life for most insects is to be alive for a very brief period of time, perhaps eat for a bit, and then be crushed or eaten by another insect, or starve, or something like that. So you get a small amount of enjoyment from eating, uh, but then you die. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the death might be quite unpleasant. You might be parasitized and you know paralyzed for a long period of time while you're eaten from the inside out, things like that. Or partially crushed, uh, but, but, but still conscious, if insects are conscious. Uh, on the other hand, especially imagining the insect farms, uh, if you had lots of crickets... Uh, they would probably live for a few months, uh, at least a few weeks. Uh, they, as I understand it, would be killed probably painlessly using carbon monoxide gas or something like that. So the slaughter would be would just be involving poisoning by gas, which uh, I think I think we know some uh, poisons for insects that we believe don't trigger any neural response. So there's, they're unlikely to cause pain. Or at least that, that's one approach that we could take in principle. Uh, and in the meantime, they just get to chomp down on some calories. Mm-hmm. And if insects are conscious, they probably enjoy eating like <laughs> other animals do. Uh, so, uh, so, that, that, so that's a case in favor of animal farms. And possibly you might also think it, it could be good for insects to be conscious in the wild because they just enjoy eating so much and their deaths are relatively quick. Uh, and especially with insects, we might not be too concerned about the broader philosophical questions of, uh, you know, it, it, is it bad to, to live a short life where you don't fully actualize yourself? Because mm-hmm. I don't really know what it is for a cricket to actualize themselves. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I think these are great questions for research. And, and I think there's a need for a lot more research on insects mm-hmm. in general. The, the one thing I would say is I don't think it's going to be an either or choice of being wild or farmed. I yeah. think that the wild population is is kind of a constant in this. Um so where we talk about farming insects, we're largely talking about an addition of, of more insects. And so then even if wild insects have net negative lives, uh, 
that wouldn't justify farmed insects having mildly less negative net negative lives. Yeah. Now, if you think that farmed insects might have net positive lives, that certainly is is a positive argument for for insect farming. The the limited amount that I've researched on this makes me think that is unlikely. That if if insects are conscious the experiences they experience in insect farms are probably pretty negative. And that has a lot to do with just the need to raise so many insects in such a confined space. And, and certainly insects are used to a certain degree of crowding, but this takes it far beyond what they're used to. And to the point where you get a very strong stress response. Exactly, yeah. And so th- there's that. And, and there's also uh, the slaughter methods I've seen described have been less uh, humane than the ones uh, yeah. that, that you're describing. I would also worry that... We, we know so little about the brains of insects that our ability to even ensure that something was humane is, is, is limited. Mm-hmm. But uh, I, I generally, so I generally view this as, as more likely than not to be a negative development, more insect farming. That's not to say there's not a decent sized probability that it, it, it could be otherwise. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that that's why it worries me. But I, but I certainly do think this is somewhere we need more research. I mean, not just on the question of, of conditions, but also on, on this basic consciousness question. Mm. Another approach that I've heard suggested is doing research into which insecticides uh, might uh, kill insects in ways that are, that are, that are more humane, because we do kill extraordinary numbers of insects in, in plant agriculture as well as animal agriculture. Do you, do you have any thoughts on that? It, it seems like an important field of research. Mm. It makes a lot of sense to me that we should find the insecticides uh, as well as chemicals that are going to cause the least harm to sentient beings. And certainly, given given the possibility that insects are conscious, I think it makes a lot of sense to look at insect sites. Okay. Yeah, possibly in the future we'll be able to find a scientist who knows something about that, that or one, <laughs> one, of the, one of the two humane insecticide yeah. research, researchers <laughs> in the world. Uh, if you're a bit sceptical about insect farming, uh, what about eating mussels? So mm. I'm, I'm almost vegan, uh, but I think... I, I have some risk aversion about mm. the health effects of not eating uh, animal products mm-hmm. at all. Uh, I think it's probably pretty healthy, but mm-hmm. like the ideal diet, just given our evolutionary history, might well involve mm-hmm. some meat. So I, I, I looked around for what meat can I eat that seems like uh, it's most humane, uh, and that appears to be mussels, which mm-hmm. also happen to be extremely ta- uh, well, quite tasty mm-hmm. and uh, uh, and extremely healthy, um, and and actually very cheap. Um, so uh, the, the basic logic there uh, is that uh, muscles, but if you look at their nervous system, mm. the odds of their conscious is probably even lower than insects, or at least mm. it's maybe, maybe similar to insects. Mm-hmm. There's some ways in which they're more sophisticated and some ways in which they're less. Mm-hmm. Uh, and also that uh, the muscles that I buy are grown on ropes in places like Chile or Scotland, just, mm-hmm. just off the coast. Um, they, they put kind of the, 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 the sperm for the muscles mm-hmm. down on these ropes and then they, they grow over a period of years and mm-hmm. then the, the ropes are pulled up and they're uh, snap frozen or I think uh, boiled quite quickly. Mm-hmm. Uh, my sense is that if they're conscious, they probably enjoy sitting on ropes eating plankton. Mm-hmm. Uh, it seems positive. Uh, they're not really preyed upon or anything like that. Mm-hmm. They don't have stress in their lives. <laughs> probably less stress than I have. Um, mm-hmm. And then uh, they're killed pretty quickly one mm-hmm. way or another. Uh, does that seem good to you? Do, do you eat mussels? I don't eat mussels, <laughs> but you know, I've, I've always thought this seems like a marginal case. Yeah. And I, um, I've more found it... I've, I've found it easy to be vegan, mm-hmm. and so I haven't had to confront this marginal case yeah, yeah. but uh, it certainly makes sense to me that this would uh that the first of all the odds of consciousness are far lower and and secondly that the the treatment <laughs> seems uh, a lot better mm-hmm. than than other farm animals so we spent the, the last five minutes talking quite a lot about these uh you know more difficult cases where it's mm-hmm. harder to tell whether whether animals are sentient or not uh, and in fact, one of your colleagues, Luke Mohauser, uh, wrote an incredibly long and detailed post that covers you know, both kind of the natural science uh, side and the philosophy side of trying to figure out uh, which, or, you know, what is conscious or mm. what creatures are morally relevant and which ones are not, uh, which talks about you know, different kinds of species, including insects. And I think even ventures into thinking about well, what kinds of artificial intelligences could conceivably have moral standing as well. Uh, we'll put up a link to that, obviously. It's, it's a pretty long read, but it has a, has a good summary at the start. And it's, I think, one of the best sources on this topic out there anywhere. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I strongly recommend reading it. I mean, Luke has read a lot more of the literature around consciousness than I have, and I think he does a great job of synthesizing some, some really plausible views of consciousness. Hmm.
I think it's great that we have a charitable foundation that's willing <laughs> to do almost fundamental research in philosophy uh, to, to, to guide their decisions. That's, uh, that's not, not so common. Yeah, I agree. I think it's, I mean, it's one of the real luxuries at, at Open Phil is that we have the resources and the talent to, uh, to really probe into questions like this that are so foundational. I'll, uh, I'll try to have a more thorough read of that in future and perhaps let get Luke on the podcast to talk about it. That sounds good. So we've been talking for quite a while already, uh, but now I want to get to the uh, kind of last third of the conversation where we, we've discussed the, the issue in general, what approaches can be taken in general, but I want to make it extremely concrete to give listeners specific advice mm-hmm. about what they can do to more effectively help animals at any stage of, of their career. So first question would be, if someone's listening and they're an undergraduate uh, or perhaps they're considering going to university, uh, what things would you be most enthusiastic about them studying, uh, assuming that they were a good fit for that area? Sure. So I think there are a couple of of pretty exciting career paths that could be followed. The the first one we've alluded to is is the technological path. Uh, And so I think for someone who has scientific aptitude or scientific interest, thinking about whether they could pursue, for instance, cellular biology and use that uh, for helping grow meat or whether they could take classes in tissue engineering or in plant uh, plant science and, and understanding the kind of the, the plant proteins that could be used. Um, that's one very appealing career path. Another one I think is just developing really strong management skills. I think that there is a constant need at nonprofits of all varieties. So those advancing animal welfare reforms, but also those in the technological sector and elsewhere for really good, robust management skills. Uh, And that could mean going to business school or it could mean uh, taking extracurriculars or otherwise working, say, within college to really develop those skills. I think that another exciting path is just developing capacities as a campaigner. And some of that is is obviously kind of innate to how someone, how extroverted someone is, to what degree they, they kind of just have a sense for things. But I think a lot of it is, is learned and a lot of it is skills in terms of public relations, interacting with the media, being a spokesperson and, and being articulate as a spokesperson, having a sense of strategy and uh, having a sense of how to engage with a company and, and also understanding some of the animal welfare science issues. Uh, so I think even just for a campaigner, that's that's quite a useful tool to have. Um, another path, obviously, is to become an animal welfare scientist. And uh, I think that's typically neglected by people who care about animals because the animal welfare science programs tend to be very unfriendly <laughs> toward animals and, and not only require people to test on animals while they're going through those programs, but also often promote pretty bad ethoses. But I think if you look at someone like Temple Grandin, who's an animal welfare scientist who's been very pro-welfare, unlike most animal welfare scientists, I think she's had a huge impact in terms of mitigating some of the worst harms within slaughterhouses. So I think there's a lot that could be done there. Um, and, then, and then a kind of real inside track is, is thinking about going to work for food companies and uh, whether you could develop the kind of business skills that would be useful to work, say, in a sustainability or a purchasing department for a major food company, perhaps a grocer, where you could really influence their decisions over the long term. So if someone has uh, just graduated, uh, what would be some, some good places to, to start their career if they wanted to get their, their foot in the door in, in the sector? And I'm aware that uh, often these entry-level roles can be uh, very competitive, mm-hmm. especially in some of the, of the animal charities. Yeah, I mean, the, the best advice I generally have is to, to start getting involved in the actual sector rather than for animal advocacy at least, focusing on career capital. I think that there is a the, the best kind of uh, career capital in animal advocacy tends to be career capital gained at those at those advocacy groups themselves. Mm-hmm. So I, w- I would encourage people to apply for roles uh, if, if they want to become an activist or work for an advocacy group, apply for roles at, at the Humane League, at Mercy for Animals, at Animal Equality, at the Humane Society. Mm-hmm. Uh, if they want to go down the, the scientific route, I imagine there's, there's a lot more studying that needs to be done first, but, but ultimately trying as early as possible to get into a lab or a company that is working on plant-based meat, that's working on cellular agriculture, so that their skills are going to be really focused and really honed on, on, on that one issue. Um, and, and I do think that, that I've certainly found it to be true that just thinking at each step – 
which of these opportunities open to me right now would give me the potential to start impacting this issue as soon as possible because i think the real value there obviously it's more motivating to know that what you're doing is actually starting to have an impact on on the issue you care about but i also think there you get a far better feedback loop you start learning a lot quicker if you're doing something that's really relevant within that space you start seeing okay this is having an impact on animals or it's not having as much impact on animals as i thought and that kind of provides a, a useful framework to then reflect on how would i change this how could i have more impact for animals hmm. Should people start doing extracurricular animal-related work when they're studying? And what kind of options are there? Yeah, I think it's a great idea. So I think it, it depends a lot on what someone's expertise is. If someone is, is thinking they want to be a frontline campaigner, then getting out there for protests and uh, leafleting and joining corporate campaigns by leaving messages online and, and each of the groups kind of has their own activist network, the Humane Heroes Network and so on, you can find online. But I think even for people who don't want to be activists, I think there is, first of all, a huge amount of value in networking in this space. So going, for instance, to the Animal Rights Conference every year, it's held in Washington, D.C. one year, in L.A. the next year, and just going there and getting to know people in the field, becoming involved with a local animal group in their, their town or city or in their campus, I think, will help with that networking. And even just emailing people and asking for advice, I think, is, is one really helpful way to get to know people in the field. And then the other thing I would say is wherever possible... Uh, really integrating this into their academic work. So, for instance, for myself, I was studying social studies in college. I was often able in classes to write about an animal advocacy-related issue, so to write about the history of the animal advocacy movement or the ethics of endorsing violence within the animal advocacy movement or other issues that things that I really wanted to reflect on or think about. I'm sure my writing did nothing to advance the literature, but it really provided me a, a great opportunity to really delve in, to think my own thoughts through hard, and to do some research and find out more things. Hmm. Do you want to talk a bit about the pathway to becoming a food scientist or someone working on clean meat in particular? Because that's a kind of a huge issue in itself. Like, how, how do you go from being a high school student to actually mm. being a research scientist? Yeah, so I, I probably have less insight into this than, than others might. But the, the sense I get is that right now, the, the most exciting research going on in the space is going on at a number of startups. So it's going on at Impossible Foods, it's going on at Memphis Meats, at Beyond Meat. And for people who want to work at those companies, I get the strong sense that once they have the academic sort of chops, so once they've at least gotten an undergraduate degree in the relevant science, and I think probably ideally have a graduate degree in the relevant scientific field, applying directly to those companies, I think, is, is probably the best way to go. And my sense is that they are always searching for really top scientists in this field. So certainly you could go to work in another lab or you could go to work in another company, but I'm, I'm very much of the view that you're, you're better off going and getting started in this field right now such that your experience will be very specifically focused on, on the most relevant field. If someone wanted to work with you or uh, animal charity evaluators, uh, what kinds of skills do they need and what, what should they study? So I think the most important skill is analytical. I, I think just understanding how to gather a lot of information together, whether it's online research, whether it's data provided, whatever, and really just to sift through that and work out what's important, to work out what the insights are from that, and to work out how that should affect our beliefs and our actions. That's, that's really the most important skill that I can think of. And I think that that is honed most through kind of a liberal arts education. I mean, I think it's honed a lot through writing research papers, whether they're scientific research papers or humanities research papers, I think it's honed through interacting with data, whether it's in statistics classes or math classes or, or for a job. Um, and I think it's often honed by extracurricular activities like debate or like writing for student newspaper or writing a blog, writing a blog. Exactly. I think that the, I think there's a huge amount of value to people, you know, just starting to write a blog or starting to write some research papers and throw them online. And and I would worry less about, you know, is this initially going to really contribute to the literature or, you know, provide groundbreaking insights and more, how can this really help help me to gain skills and to hone my skills further? Mm. Are there any skill sets that are especially abundant in among people who want to want to help animals, uh, where perhaps you're not going to have a comparative advantage if, if you're bringing those specific skills to the table? I think legal skills could actually be one of those. Oh, there's, uh, there's there's kind of a funny uh, consequence of about a decade ago, a philanthropist 
uh, Bob Barker, actually, off The Price is Right, uh, he endowed animal law programs at most major American law schools. And partly because of that, and partly because I think law students tend to be socially conscious and, and thinking about what needs to be changed in the world, there's been a real influx of lawyers who care about farm animals and, and care about animal issues, which is great, and it's great we have that set. But Is it great to have so many lawyers? <laughs> I was going to say, how much damage have they done? <laughs> <laughs> I, think it's, I think it's generally a positive, and I think... Um, and I think certainly, you know, you see when important cases come up on farm animals, there are a lot of lawyers at top law firms wanting to case, take these cases pro bono. So there is no shortage of uh, lawyers who would like to work for free on this issue, which makes me think that if you're a prospective student out there, unless you're really sure that your comparative advantage is being a lawyer and being a litigator, that it, it might make sense to reflect a little more on, on alternative approaches. Mm. We have a career review on legal careers uh, coming out uh, in the next, sometime in the next few months that I think is going to say basically that. Cool. Uh, that direct work as a lawyer is quite challenging. Yeah. Uh, are there any particular programs of study or possibly even particular PhD supervisors that you would like to highlight for people who are open to doing graduate study? So I, I think certainly on the scientific side that thinking about graduate study in plant biology, cellular biology, each of the kind of pieces of the scientific puzzle makes makes a lot of sense. I don't know supervisors on that front. I think when it comes to graduate study outside of the sciences, I think the case is, is a lot less clear. Um, I would say that for people who feel very pulled toward that, then it could make sense. So, for instance, someone who has the potential to be the next Peter Singer should, you know, go and, and do uh, grad school in, in philosophy. But I think most people are not going to be the next Peter Singer. Uh, I think yeah, that... It would be an odd world if most people were going to be the next <laughs> Peter Singer. A lot of Peter Singers, I suppose. <laughs> it's true. Uh, so, so, and I, I think that's probably true, too, across other fields, where there may be value to having one exceptional historian working on this and providing insights for the movement. There may be value to having one I exceptional social scientist who can perform studies or an exceptional economist who cares about this and will do, do better cost-benefit analysis. But I think for the most part, those are not the skills that are in complete need right now, and most of the skills that are don't, don't require graduate degrees. So certainly, you know, it, it may be useful to have a business degree. It might be useful in some cases to have a law degree. I think sometimes graduate degree programs can be a great time to spend a lot of time researching and thinking about things other than the graduate degree program, so maybe it provides a good forum for people to take time to do that. But I, I think otherwise I wouldn't go to grad school just for animal welfare. What are some other kind of smart early career steps that people could take? Uh, and I'm thinking, uh, you know, how else can you go about building a network or, or learning relevant skills outside of university? Or, uh, you know, are there any jobs that people can take while they're undergraduates? Yeah, I would encourage undergraduates to look at interning with an animal organization. I think there's a lot of value to doing a summer internship or term time internship with an animal organization and really getting a sense from that of what the work's like, starting to connect with people and, uh, and, and really starting to build some of the relevant skill sets. There's also, in addition to internships, there are a lot of campus programs. So the Humane League, Mercy for Animals and others are on a lot of campuses now looking for campus coordinators. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great way to get further looped in. I would certainly think about attending the conferences uh, where that's possible. Uh, think about just reaching out to activists for advice. I think you'll find a lot of them are, are willing to chat with interested people. Yeah. Uh, which specific organizations offer internships? So the Humane Society of the United States does, and, and it does actually in, in multiple different areas. So that's kind of a good one if you're unsure whether you want to be a campaigner or you want to be a lobbyist, then those are both different internship opportunities, and that can be a great way to kind of test that. Uh, Mercy for Animals does. So does, uh, I think, the Humane League does. Um, I think it's quite likely that animal equality does, so I'm, I'm, I'm not certain on that. And I, I imagine you would find that a number of other groups, even if they don't have formal internship programs, if you went to them, particularly, obviously, if you have kind of some kind of sponsorship from your university, but if you went to them and, and offering your services as a summer intern, I think a lot of them would be receptive to that. Mm. 
Is it how important is it to be kind of obsessively interested in the animal welfare cause to be to be involved in solving the problem? Uh, I don't think it's essential. I think that um, there are certainly people who have a wide variety of cause interests, but recognize that they can have a greater marginal impact in animal welfare because there are so few people relatively working on it, and there are such sort of strong skill needs and and more obvious solutions. So I've, I've definitely seen that. That said, I, I do think it is useful um, to, to really care about the issue, and I think that that obviously will, will motivate you to want to work more and, and so on. But I think also for myself, I found it's just motivated me more to research questions about this. So I, I'm generally really interested and excited to find out the answers to questions about animal welfare advocacy. And that makes it far less of a duty and far more of a kind of exciting, fun job than it might be otherwise. Thinking outside of just animal advocacy organisations and, you know, uh, clean meat groups, are there any government agencies Mm. or think tanks or anything like that that would be particularly promising to, to try to build a career to work for? Yeah, so I think if you're uh, if you're kind of uh, resilient in the way that an undercover investigator might need to be, then certainly working for a government agency could be viable. I think the trouble is that they the government agencies that directly regulate the space tend to be pretty hostile to animal welfare, so it can be hard to work there if you're sort of overtly passionate about the issue. But I do think that someone in working for the U.S. Department of Agriculture, for instance, could have a real impact. And and in particular there, working for one of the sub-agencies, either the Food Safety and Inspection Service, which is in charge of monitoring humane slaughter conditions, or the Agricultural Marketing Service, which sets the procurement standards for all federal meat buying and animal product buying. I think in either of those departments, there are kind of obvious routes to how you could, could have some impact. I think there are some other sort of more obscure roles where you might. So, for instance, working at the Food and Drug Administration and having an influence over how plant-based foods are labeled or regulated, uh, you could potentially have a significant impact. I think that working in the office of a receptive senator or congressperson, you might be able to. And I say receptive because I think in a lot of offices, they're probably not going to even let you work on the issue. Um, So you would really want to be sure that it was somewhere you could work on the issue. Because you've got Cory Booker is vegan. Cory Booker is, is both vegan and a great champion for farm animal welfare. So I think that, that is a, I think that's a great example of an office where, you know, obviously you're not making the marginal impact of actually persuading him because he's, he's already persuaded. But you could make a great marginal impact in helping him to implement uh, reforms and, and changes that he's pushing. The, uh, the other thing I would say is that I think at the state level, there, there may be more potential. So... I know pretty little about State Departments of Agriculture, and I could imagine that uh, trying to work at the Iowa Department of Agriculture would be very tough unless you're really good at uh, talking, <laughs> the talk. talking the talk and, and not, not coming across as an animal yeah. advocate. But I do think it's totally possible that at, at some of those places, if you're really kind of willing to work on the inside, a State Department of Agriculture or even perhaps a district attorney's office in a really rural county where there are lots of factory farms, Again, if you're if you're able to operate in that environment, and I think it's worth asking very seriously whether you really would be able to work in that environment, then that could be a potentially high impact path. There's also the issue that in bureaucracies, often you don't get that much discretion over which projects mm-hmm. you work on. So yes, yeah. it's possible to work at the Department of Agriculture and just get shafted and moved between lots of projects that don't really provide you many opportunities to do good. Absolutely, I think that's absolutely right, and I think that one way you could perhaps reduce that risk is, for instance, by becoming an animal welfare scientist. So it's far more likely that if you apply as an animal welfare scientist that you'll get a job within the Food Safety and Inspection Service and that it will relate to humane handling. Uh, You're slightly showing your hand there, perhaps by studying animal welfare science. That's true, although, you know, the the animal welfare science is is such a conservative profession that uh, I, I think that would certainly not hurt your chances of getting a job. That would be, be seen as a positive and be seen as relevant. But they, they wouldn't realise from that that you were a reformist. <laughs> there are many animal welfare scientists who are defenders of the status quo. Are there any think tanks that work on animal welfare? Not really. <laughs> so you have Compassion and World Farming is a little bit like a think tank. Yeah, there are some parts of it in the UK that, that are a bit like that. Um, 
I guess uh, there's also Sentience Institute. Uh, yeah, so I, mean, I was gonna, I was gonna fairly, say it's very new. But. Yeah, so there's a there's a brand new group, Sentience Institute, uh, right now, just three people. But um, you know, I think that they want to be. I, I think they call it an action tank. They want to kind of have have ideas generated, but also be be implementing them. So I think that they may be the closest thing we have right now, but but not really established um, think tanks. Although. It's it's a possible career. I'm I'm skeptical that you'd be able to have much influence, but certainly possible that you know you could try working in Brookings or another major think tank and get them to start writing some things on this. And I think certainly if you were successful in that in that aim, it could be very impactful. What about running for political office? Uh, I guess I'm a little bit skeptical of this one. One because bringing up animal welfare issues on the campaign trail, uh, unless you're in a very safe seat, mm. seems like a non-starter. And two, even if you were a member of Congress, uh, there just doesn't seem to be that much appetite for reform, and I don't expect there to be that much appetite for reform uh, any anytime soon. And I imagine that you would end up working alone or maybe with just a handful of other members mm-hmm. of Congress who, who agree with you. And in fact, I think if you became a member of Congress, even if your original goal was to work on animal welfare, you would be best off to basically dump that and start working <laughs> on another uh, policy area that is highly pressing uh, and on which you can get a lot more traction. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's right. I think that generally running politically is, is not a great option for this. I think certainly there can be value to persuading people who are already in positions of political power to care about this this issue. Uh, better to recruit than to make yourself one of them. I think that's right. I mean, I think that, that your odds of becoming the chair of the Senate Agriculture Committee or one of the few other places where you can have a really strong impact on this issue are pretty low. And, and as you say, the... You know the, the seat that you would have any chance of, of winning in if you were open about your animal welfare beliefs is a seat that's likely already filled by someone who is at least pretty decent on animal welfare. So, you know, the, the liberal districts in LA and San Francisco and New York, the representatives from them consistently vote in favor of animal welfare. They would absolutely support a law tomorrow better regulating farm animal welfare, and they've tried. The problem is is the rest of the Congress, and uh, you're probably not going to be able to bring them along just by filling filling one of those seats. So, I think it would only work if if you had some really unique vantage point. You're from a rural area, but have such deep roots in the community that you could get elected, and you could be an unlikely voice for animal welfare, and and that would give you a kind of credibility or, or something like that. Are there any startups doing particularly impressive work? Well, we're in the Bay Area at the moment. Mm-hmm. Uh, possibly you know about some some other you know tech groups that uh, that are, that people could try to join. Uh, yeah, I I think that there are a number of startups doing really exciting work. So Impossible Foods, mm-hmm. Beyond Meat, um, Clara Foods. I think that uh, there are a number of companies that I'm less familiar with, so I don't want to kind of unreservedly recommend them, but. You know, I think that one of the best things for people who are interested in going into the tech sector could do is to reach out to the Good Food Institute. They very much see it as one of their roles to help direct people toward these companies and to help start new ones. So for people who are interested in being entrepreneurs, I think that's a really, really promising path. Mm. Do you just mind listing those the other organizations that uh, that there are, uh, just so that people can, can look at them, uh, even if you're not offering an endorsement per se? Sure, the other companies, yeah. So uh, Finless Foods, working on fish. Hampton Creek, working on eggs and, and now uh, clean meat. Um, there is, uh, I mean, there are the traditional, uh, more traditional plant-based companies, so like Tofurky, Gardein, uh, Eves. There's. Uh, I love my tofurkey. <laughs> yeah, I like it too. And apparently, they were pretty cool. Uh, pretty cool office up in uh, up in Portland, Oregon. Yeah. Um, the um, there's uh, Perfect Day working on growing milk. Um, there are a number of new plant based milk companies um, whose names are escaping me right now, um, and. There are a couple of smaller new plant-based companies, so like Upton's Naturals comes to mind as one of them. Um, but yeah, I'd, I'd defer to the Good Food Institute. <laughs> one problem that people we coach can often have with their career is how to break into um, work on a problem where it's very competitive and there's lots of people who are interested in working on it. Uh, and animal advocacy is uh, somewhat like that. It's not a lot of funding, but there's quite a lot of you know young people who are concerned about the problem and perhaps competing over the roles that are available. 
if someone is struggling to kind of get their first job uh, in in the the sector, uh, are there any places they can apply that where it's somewhat less competitive, where they might be able to you know start to build up their CV? Well, so I think one thing is being open to multiple kinds of roles. So I think, for instance, if you look at the Humane League or Mercy for Animals, they're often recruiting for a number of different roles, some of which are kind of less sexy than others. So there are the campaigner roles or the management roles that people want, and then there are roles that might be more administrative or more logistical or otherwise sort of back office roles. And I would say to just be very open to those kind of roles. I mean, for one thing, they're essential to these organizations. And so I think you can often have as big an impact, perhaps a greater impact, because the counterfactual is greater. There are more people who want the campaign and role, who are good and want it, than there are who want the administrative role, or even probably the fundraising role. So I'd be very open to those different kinds of roles, both because you can make an impact, but also because they can be, I think, a really useful stepping stone across to the programmatic role you might be most excited about. Um, I would also say that people should consider working for animal advocacy groups that they don't think are as effective. I mean, if, if you can't get a job at one of the most effective ones, then think about working at one of the less effective ones and, A, see if you can make it more effective. And if, if not, then, you know, at least you'll have learned some interesting lessons about how it operates and what its limitations are and, and just about advocacy in general before moving on to, to another group. Um, and, and then I guess, you know, on the, on the research side, I would say going to work for a larger food company. If you, if you can't get a, a role at, at one of these companies, then go work at a large food company, get some experience in food technology and research, and, and that will be useful down the line. And I guess there's always the indirect path of just going into a corporate job or consulting uh, like you did and then building your skills there and then mm-hmm. trying to use that, uh, leverage that to, to get a role. Although I guess you thought that that was not, not so necessary in your case, as it, as it turned out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's right. I, I didn't think it was essential in my case, but certainly always an option. Mm. Uh, so those were, that, that were, those were the relatively easier positions to get. What if someone is you know, a real gun and they want to do the absolute best that they can uh, and they're thinking, what should be my, my ideal aspiration for where to end up in 10 or 20 or 30 years later in my career? Uh, who do you think is doing like, the absolute best work, just the best few places? Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't want to um, just say one or two groups. I think there are a lot of people doing really exceptional work in the space. But you can certainly take an indication from who our largest grantees are, which yeah. which groups we're most excited about. I'll stick up a link to the grants page. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I can I can tell you that you know our biggest grantees right now include the Humane League, Mercy for Animals, Compassion on World Farming, Humane Society International, and in Humane Society of the United States, and Animal Equality, and the Good Food Institute, and. Mm-hmm. I think those are all great places to start. They're certainly not the only places, and we have we have other grantees and other groups we haven't given grants to yet that I think are definitely worth considering, and, and I'd be excited for people to start working for. One reservation that some people have about working on farm animal welfare is that they're concerned that they won't develop as much career capital as they might in another path. And that concern can come in various different forms. One might be that they think that the organizations they could work for perhaps just aren't as exceptional in terms of implementation or organization as perhaps some corporate places that they could go. Another might be just that the credentials and the skills and the knowledge that they'll be building up won't be transferable Mm. to if they decide later on that that they want to work on a problem other than farm animal welfare. Uh, what, what, what do you say to these, con- these kind of concerns? So I think it's, it's certainly a fair concern that if someone's not yet sure that this is the issue they want to work on, then perhaps they should find a more generalist mm-hmm. role. I think that insofar as someone is sure they want to work on this issue, then I think it definitely makes sense to start getting involved now. The other thing I would say is that if, if the uncertainty about whether they want to work on this issue um, is, for instance, uncertainty between working on multiple different EA causes. My suspicion is that if you've worked for an EA animal welfare group, other EA groups are going to be pretty receptive to hiring you if you're if you're talented. That will still look good for you that you've you've been doing sort of an EA cause. I think too that if you're um, pursuing work on the technology side, those are really transferable skills. So you could work for Impossible Foods for five years, and I suspect you'd be in a really good position to get a job for another food company after that if you decided you made the wrong choice. Are there any other risks to getting involved in this problem area? I suppose some, some people don't like vegans and they don't like animal <laughs> welfare campaigners. Is it possible that it could limit your career options just because people will kind of d- dislike the work that you've done in the past? 
I think certainly some groups in this space are controversial. I think it's unlikely that people are not going to hire you because they don't like animal welfare. I think if you've worked at, at a group that is perceived as more radical or confrontational or more explicitly vegan, that could limit you, particularly if you might want to go into a very conservative career path in, in future. But I, I generally think that people worry a bit too much about that, and I actually think one uh, good example is Jason Matheny, who's probably familiar to many of your listeners as, as the head of IAPA. I'm, I'm planning to speak with him in the next month. So. Oh, great. Cool. So he, uh, he wrote a lot of great stuff about animal welfare uh, over the last decade and more, and including some things that, that people might consider controversial. Uh, and this really doesn't seem to have limited his ability, even within the relatively conservative environment of government agency. So, well, an intelligence agency. And an intelligence agency, that. So I, I they think... Might, they might be very cautious about who they hire. Yeah, so I, I, I think that if you can... If, if, if he can publish all these pieces, I think that other people shouldn't, uh, shouldn't worry too much about it. So at 80,000 Hours and Open Fill, we're all about uh, prioritization. So it would be useful if you could describe maybe uh, the most ideal kind of two or three people, uh, maybe in their late 20s, who you'd be most excited to meet. Um, what kind of skills would they have and, and how would they be able to apply them to animal welfare? Sure. So I think the first person is a scientist straight out of a, a program in cellular biology or, or something similar and excited to start working on either clean meat research or plant-based meat research looking to work either in an academic program um, or to go straight to a startup. And and really there, I think the most important thing is just that they have really strong scientific aptitude in that field and obviously a strong motivation. The second person is a really competent generalist. So they're someone who could be a really effective corporate campaigner. They could be uh, effective online campaigner or other in, in another role for an advocacy group and they could be a really good manager down the line and so I think that there are a couple of skills they would have they would be first of all really um, good at communication so they would they would be really good at communicating both internally with, with others and externally written and verbally I think they would have some analytical ability to, to understand to kind of quickly grasp issues um, but I think perhaps more than anything, they would be pragmatic, really open to learning from trial and error. I think some of the most exciting improvements I've seen in animal advocacy have just come from, from trial and error and people who are really open to learning based on that. And so that's not necessarily a particular skill set, but it's, it's sort of a mindset to, to foster that I think is, is most useful and, and probably useful at the management level too. Um, and then perhaps the third person would be a, a researcher of either effective advocacy or someone who could work in a kind of similar role to what I do as, as a program officer at a foundation, someone who's heavily analytical, more focused on research and is sort of interested in stepping back and, and looking either at individual interventions or at big picture strategy and thinking really hard about how we can improve those and, and shape the future of the farm animal movement better. What do you think about the value of the career capital that people get doing farm animal welfare work in general? Uh, do you think it's like it's very very positive or, or a bit weak compared to other options? Well, I think it's I think it's very positive for future farm animal work. Yeah, <laughs> I yeah. think I think the most useful career capital for long term farm animal work is farm animal work. Uh, I think as as far as it goes for other fields, it probably depends depends a lot on what you'd want to do next. So if if your long-term ambition is to earn to give, then I think you're better off not going into animal welfare work. It's it's not going to provide useful career capital for earning to give. I think if your long-term ambition is to be fairly agnostic between a number of EA causes such that you have skills that are kind of easily transferable depending on what you update to thinking is the most important cause, I think it's quite likely that working in animal welfare, as, as working in another EA cause now, could be pretty transferable. I mean, certainly I think a lot of the skills that animal welfare nonprofits need to thrive and succeed are similar to the skills that other EA groups need to thrive and succeed in, in terms of thinking about good management, good community building, good recruiting, good uh, analysis, you know, all good communication, all those things that are sort of really positive central skills. Um, and I think, too, some of the more unlikely animal welfare careers down the road 
uh, it could also be quite useful to work in that environment, and not necessarily preclude you from working, you know, whether it's a government agency, whether it's a company. I think particularly if you don't work at a, a animal group that's perceived to be radical, then you leave a lot of doors open. My impression is that far, um, animal welfare organisations, at least the ones that I'm aware of uh, that are associated with effective altruism, are, are often among the most funding constrained, that they mm. often feel like they're most limited by, by access to money. Does this suggest that people who are concerned with animal welfare uh, should be more inclined to do earning to give and perhaps rather than work in the area, instead make money and give it away? I, I don't think so. I think that that was true until two years ago, or it was true until 18 months ago when we, when we started grant making in this field. I think the situation has dramatically <coughs> improved in terms of funding, largely because of Open Phil entering this field, but also because of a number of other very generous donors who have either entered the field or significantly increased their giving in the last two years. So right now, I think there is a bigger talent gap than financial gap for farm animal welfare groups. That's not to say it'll always be that way. And I certainly do think that someone whose aptitude or inclination is heavily toward earning to give, it could still well make sense. So if someone is just has great quantitative skills and enjoys working at a hedge fund, then I would say earn to give. You know, that that could be just still a really powerful way. And we will need more and more funders over time to continue scaling up the movement. But all things equal, I would encourage someone to to focus more on, on the talent piece now because I do think that things have really flipped in the last few years and I'm pretty optimistic that the funding will continue to grow in this space for, for animal welfare. Yeah, what makes you confident about that? I think a couple. You don't expect to be fired in the next few years? <laughs> <laughs> First, I hope I won't be fired, but I, I think there's a deep commitment from the Open Flying 3 project to continue strong funding in the space, to continue funding at at least the level we're funding currently, and, and hopefully more. Um, I've also just seen a number of new large-ish funders coming online. So just in the last two years, I'd say the number of funders giving more than $200,000 a year has doubled. And I started to see some real interest from some other major potential funders. So I think it's it's kind of natural that as this issue has gained public prominence, so with it, a lot of potential donors have, have or, or people who have great wealth, have realized this is something important and this is something that they can make a great, a great difference. I guess in your case, it's pretty clear that it's fortunate you didn't go out earning to give. So uh, you're, you're enabling Open Phil to probably dispense millions more dollars each year, and you probably couldn't have made anything like that amount of money. Yeah, that's right. I mean, obviously, the counterfactual is who else would have this mm. job. I mean, I, I, I am not the reason why Open Phil is working on this issue. So if I wasn't in this role, there would be someone else in it. And I don't have a sense. They, it's quite possible they'd be as good as me. It's quite possible they'd be better than me. So in, in, in that case, perhaps I should have done something else. But Although then they wouldn't be doing whatever they're doing now. That's true. Probably providing things that you can fund. That's true. That's true. So I think that um, I'm very happy that things have turned out as they have. And I certainly very seriously considered earning to give. That was a, a major potential career path for me, both coming out of college and then again coming out of law school. And when I think particularly the kind of cautious careers that I was considering, the low-risk career of consulting or lawyering, <laughs> there's, I'm confident I could have ended up giving at least a million dollars a year, but I'm not confident that it would have ever become a lot more than that. And, and certainly I think the potential to better influence how $25 million a year is spent uh, is a greater influence. Uh, something that can really help advance people's career is finding a good mentor or a sponsor to help them learn what they need to know and get the introductions they need. I imagine you're too busy to do that for uh, for dozens of people all at once. Mm. Are there any other people who you might be able to nominate who can be good at you know pushing people's careers forward? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think this is a is a great reason for people to start getting involved with animal groups in college, whether it's in their college group, whether it's going to conferences, or whether it's getting involved for a group. I wouldn't want to volunteer anyone's services by by name because yeah. I, I don't know their uh, schedule. But I would say that I think there are a lot of, of very impressive people at groups like the Humane League, Mercy for Animals, the Humane Society, Compassion World Farming, the Good Food Institute, Animal Quality. And I think that a lot of those people would be very receptive to becoming mentors. In fact, I think it would be a great idea for there to be a more organized mentorship program within the movement. And I think there is a little bit of that within the campus programs that have been started by the Humane League and, and Mercy for Animals. But I do think the best thing is just to get connect with one of these groups, 
find who it is within that organization that you either really respect or really click with and then just ask them to be to be a mentor Creating better mentorship networks is something that 80,000 Hours has considered doing, but unfortunately, I don't think we're going to get to it in the, in the, in the short term. But mm-hmm. uh, prob- prob- there's a decent chance we will in the medium term. Yeah, and I, I mean, I can say on this too, actually, that uh, two mentorships, essentially, that you know, were never framed quite as such, but have really functioned that way and have been very important to me, have been firstly Paul Shapiro at the Humane Society of the United States, who, who ran the farm animal program, and also Wayne Paselli, the CEO of the Humane Society of the United States. And I think that both of them I've learned a huge amount. I never explicitly asked for them to mentor me, but I, I sort of tried to stay in touch and and where possible to to get their advice and, and get their wisdom and that, that has been tremendously helpful. What's the biggest downside of going into animal advocacy or I guess also uh, food research? Mm-hmm. I, I mean, I think, first of all, it can be emotionally draining work. So less the food research, but on the on the animal advocacy side, it can be hard for people who aren't resilient. It can be hard if if seeing footage of animal cruelty really breaks you down and, and makes you sort of despondent or hopeless, then it can be really hard because that a lot of this work involves trying to get that footage to other people and involves trying to to grapple with that the, that imagery. So there needs to be a kind of resiliency or strength you have in, in the face of that. So I guess that rules me out. I've just wasted the last three hours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So so I do think that's I think that's a, I think that's a downside. Um, another downside is that uh, typically animal advocacy groups have not paid <laughs> anything comparable to not just the private sector but even other nonprofits. And I think that's getting better. I think that um, we've been encouraging and animal advocacy groups have independently been trying to raise salaries and, and reward talent better. But it is still certainly the case that the nonprofit side, salaries are low. And I think that is less so on the for-profit food companies. So I think that if that's an important factor for people, uh, that's worth considering. And, and, and frankly, like I think, too, that there's often been a, a disdain for people even considering that factor, as if that's sort of a betrayal of animals, Stephen, or betrayal of EA, to think that, you know, your salary matters. But it, I think it does for some people. And so I think that... Well, to be, well, especially if they have families. Especially if you have families, exactly. And so I think for people to be honest with themselves about their circumstances and about whether it is sustainable for them to earn whatever salary is on offer, I think that's a really important question and, and a potential downside of a lot of roles. Well, I've taken up an enormous amount of your time. We've been uh, recording for, for over three hours. Um, so we should, we should probably finish up and uh, let, you, let you get to your work. Uh, do you want to give a kind of final motivating call to arms to people to, to, to get involved? Sure. Well, yeah, thank you for your time too. This has been a really, really fun podcast. I think that uh, I, I would just encourage people to consider an active career in animal welfare. I think that there is a huge need for talent but I think the flip side of that is there is amazing opportunity for talent. It's still a very young movement. There's still a huge potential for upward mobility within groups. And there's a huge potential to make a major difference within the issue because there are still so few people working on it and it's still so early in the movement and there's still such a huge problem we're trying to trying to affect and, and we're really gaining traction. So I think it's an exciting time for people who, who have an interest in this to get involved and to, to take up a, a full-time job in animal welfare. My guest today has been Lewis Bollard. Thanks for coming on the, on the 80,000 Hours podcast, Lewis. Thanks, Rob. I hope you enjoyed that episode. Congrats for making it all the way to the end. You can support the show by posting this episode on Facebook, Twitter, or wherever else you happen to have an audience. And as I said at the start, if what we've talked about today uh, piqued your interest in working on farm animal warfare, you should definitely apply for free one-on-one career coaching from 80,000 Hours. Uh, The link to the application form is in the show notes or the blog post where you found this episode. Thanks for joining. Talk to you next week.